approving the agenda as proposed. Seeing none, the agenda as proposed stands approved by consent. The next item is the approval of the proceedings from the August 2016 board meeting. Are there any uh, changes to those minutes? Yes, uh, Emerson Hasbrook. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I noticed that um, in, the, in the proceedings, um, starting on page, page one or page two, uh, the header indicates that it's for the February 2016 board meeting. Um, the cover says it was for the August 2016 meeting. I would just suggest that the individual page, the header on each of the individual pages be updated to indicate that it's the August 2016 meeting. Thank you. That's a controversial suggestion, but I'm going to take it as a, uh, a very uh, fair and reasonable uh, modification to the minutes. Uh, is there any objection to approving the minutes as just modified? Seeing none, the minutes as modified stand approved by consent, and thank you, Dot, for doing such a continuing great job as our stenographer. Uh, public comment is the next item on the agenda. This is an opportunity for anyone from the public who wishes to comment on any issue that's not on today's agenda to do so, which means that if your comments pertain to either the 2017 specifications or the draft PID for Amendment 3, now is not the time to comment. There will be opportunities to comment on at least one of those issues uh, when we get to them, the PID in particular. Uh, we do have a sign-up sheet, and we have three uh, people signed up, so I will go in order, uh, beginning first with Mr. Robert T. Brown. Robert T. Brown, President of the Maryland Waterman's Association. I want to thank the Chair and the Commissioners for allowing me to speak today on Manhattan. First, I would like to thank the Commission for allowing two quota bycatch per vessel per day. This has allowed our fishermen to continue work this year, and they thank you as well. A majority of the Manhattan in Maryland are caught by pound nets, which is a stationary gear. In Maryland, our quota is only 1.37 percent of the overall quota. Fishing management is not a pre precise science, and it has so many unknowns and assumptions. The technical, co technical committee uses the best science available at the time to make proposals to this commission. If the technical committee determines that the spawning stock is in decline and determined action needs to be taken, the commission acts promptly. Now the technical committee proposes an increase up to 40 percent without harming the fishing stock. I ask the commission to act swiftly and promptly today. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Uh, next, I have John McMurray. Yeah, I'm going to pass, Mr. Chairman. I signed the wrong sheet, apparently. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so then the next and last would be Zach Cliver. Yeah, I had signed up to speak to Menhaden as well. Now's the time. Now's the time. Okay. Okay, well, I, I am uh, very excited that you're all here. Welcome to Bar Harbor. I know you've been welcomed many times to Maine, but uh, my name is Zach Cliver, and I work as a naturalist for the Whale Watch Company here in Bar Harbor. And uh, it's very appropriate that we're talking about Menhaden in the context of Bar Harbor. Historically, uh, these islands that are right out uh, offshore from here, a uh, hundred years ago, there were many fish shacks on them, and in the fish shacks were pogey presses, and there they would squeeze uh, the menhaden down uh, for oil. And um, if the wind was blowing the right direction, it would blow the fish smell all over the town of Bar Harbor, and it wasn't very popular with the summer residents. But it was a, a fish run that made it um, a lot of times up into Frenchman Bay. Uh, so I want to congratulate you on the, the work you've done recently to increase the stock of Menhaden in the Atlantic Ocean. And the fact that we had Menhaden coming up to Portland this summer was very exciting. Uh, we're hopeful that the Menhaden stock will continue to expand and eventually make its way back up into Frenchman Bay in large numbers. Uh, we did have a year back in the early 90s when we had a lot of Menhaden here, and uh, it was an incredible thing. There were whales in the bay, tremendous amounts of uh, runs of fish up into Frenchman Bay. 
So I hope uh, you'll continue to consider the, the tourism industry in, in all that you do with fisheries. Uh, tourism here in Maine is a $7 billion industry. It's more than all of fisheries, forestry, and agriculture put together. And so the more we can expand this stock, it's great for tourism. It's also good for the lobster industry. Uh, we know that uh, quite a few of the fishermen were able to catch bait uh, this summer, and so I hope as the population continues that it will benefit the, the main lobster industry tremendously as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else from the public who wishes to address the board? Yes, ma'am, in the back. Um, Jenny B. Christen from here in Maine, and um, I don't know if this is the appropriate place or time t to uh, ask about this, but I was wondering if perhaps it might be time to think about a possible control date for Menhaden. Um, if we're not going to look at it, you know, unless it's, you know, for the future, we talk about redistributing the allocations that um, at least in Maine we have... <laughs> You might as well say no quota, and we have in the past caught an incredible amount of fish, and um, at least if we're not going to get um, redistribution of the, the coastwide quota, um, we may need to look at um, possibly limited entry in the future, or at least a control date so we can discuss it um, so that we can move forward with everyone able to make money. The more boats and boats that are in this, it's just ridiculous. You can't make money allowing every last person into the fishery when they're closed out of everything else. So um, I guess that's it. Thank you very much for that suggestion. It sounds like the type of suggestion that could be included in Amendment 3, and we will be taking up that matter uh, later in this meeting. Anyone else from the public who would like to address the board? Seeing no hands, we'll move on to the next agenda item, which is an overview of the timeline through 2019. Uh, the board has a very busy year ahead, dominated by the Amendment 3 process, but also involving uh, several other issues and actions. The, uh, act, that active pace will continue through 2018 and 2019. To ensure that the board is clear on what's ahead, that is, what's in the queue and how the various pieces and pending actions relate and will sequence. Uh, staff has put together a comprehensive timeline, which Megan is uh, about to present. We just have about 10 minutes on this item, so this is just a quick overview, really an FYI intended item. Uh, but Megan, I'm sure, will be happy to take questions after her presentation. Megan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'll just reiterate that. The purpose of this timeline is to, one, show the immense amount of action that is before this board in 2017. Um, not only do we have draft amendment three, but we have a stock assessment update. We have a socioeconomic study. We have the ongoing work of the BURP working group. And so I just wanted to highlight to everyone what's ahead and also set uniform expectations for what's going to happen at each of the board meetings. Um, today, I'm just going to go through the board meetings for 2017, but if you want a more detailed look at the committee meetings that are going to happen or what might happen in 2018 and 2019, please refer to that timeline. So if everything goes according to plan today, uh, we will be reviewing public comment on the PID at our next meeting in February. So that will include both written comment and public hearings. And the ultimate goal of this meeting is for the board to provide direction to the PDT on what management options should be included in draft amendment three. So we'll go through the PID later, but some of those um, issues such as the small scale fishery and incidental catch issue have quite a number of management options currently included in the PID. And so it'd be great to try and narrow those down. Um, other issues, such as quota rollovers, we just have public comment questions, and so it would be great to hear from the board about specific management options to include in that draft amendment. We will also review the results of the socioeconomic study, and that information will be included in draft amendment three. Our next meeting will be May 2017. This is going to be a bit of a lighter uh, board meeting, but I think it will be a, a good break. Um, we're going to focus on the FMP review. The PDT will still be drafting Amendment 3, so we'll go over 2016 landings, overages, transfers, um, as well as quotas for 2017. 
Um, I'm also going to ask the board to provide projection runs for the 2018 TAC. The TC, I think, found it really useful to have some idea of what the board's considering, and so I think we should try and use that um, method again this coming year. And then we'll hear a BURP working group update as well. All right, our August 2017 meeting is going to be quite a big lift for this board, and that's because we have three major actions that we're going to be taking here. The first will be considering draft amendment three for public comment. So the PDT will have finished writing that. We'll review it as we're going to review the PID today and hopefully approve it for public comment. Our second um, action item is going to be a consider approval of the 2017 stock assessment update for management use. So the, in the new year, the TC is going to start work on our stock assessment update. Um, Right now, this is scheduled for presentation to the board in August, and the reason we're um, scheduling it for this time is I think it's just too much of a lift for the board to consider a stock assessment update as well as final action on Amendment 3. Uh, so trying to spread out the workload of the board here um, so we can talk about each item in an effective manner. And then finally, we are going to try and set fishery specifications for 2018 at this August meeting. Uh, there are a couple of reasons for this. The first is, well, I've just heard the 2017 stock assessment update, so the board is going to be well informed as to the current status of the stock. Um, the other reason is, given our ongoing robust discussion on the 2017 TAC, um, there's a bit of hesitation in starting this discussion after taking final action on Amendment 3 um, at the annual meeting. So at the very least, I would like to begin discussion on this topic. Um, ideally, we would like to set a TAC. Um, I will just note that if the board, after they take final action on Amendment 3, wants to reconsider that TAC, that is an option. Um, but we would like to have something in place. Finally, um, our annual meeting in 2017 will be devoted to final action on Amendment 3. So we'll be reviewing the public comment, um, selecting final management options, and an implementation deadline. So this is the last slide here. Um, we've gotten a number of questions as to how the BURP working groups actions are going to fit in with the management actions of this board. And Shanna is going to provide a thorough and detailed overview of their upcoming timeline. But I just wanted to um, kind of throw up some highlights so everyone has a good idea of where we're going. So in 2017, they're going to continue to have in-person meetings and conference calls. And they're going to be focusing on two of the four models they're considering, the multi-species catch at age model and the production model with time varying parameters. In 2018, there are going to be two data workshops held, and this will be followed by two assessment workshops in 2019. And this is really the start of what we typically say is a formal uh, assessment process. Um, and then those multi-species models will be peer-reviewed at the end of 2019. And I will note that this also does include a review of the single species BAM model. So 2019 is a benchmark stock assessment year for Menhaden. So the TC will begin work on um, the BAM model. So when we go to peer review, we're going to have a complete package of both the multi-species models and the single species model so we can get the best recommendations from, from the peer review panel. And with that, I'll take any questions. Thank you, Megan. Questions for Megan? Yes, Jim. Uh, Megan, thank you for your report. Um, did I understand correctly that we will not be having a board meeting in February? We most certainly will to uh, review public comment on the PID. Thank you. Thank you. Additional questions for Megan? Seeing none, thank you, Megan. We do have a very busy year ahead of us, and I, I certainly am intending to keep us on track. So it's an ambitious uh, timeline, but uh, I think it's important that we try and do our best to reach uh, a decision point one year from now uh, on Amendment 3, which is the big one, and then uh, as well f feed in those other pieces that Megan referred to. So uh, that's where we are, and that's where we're looking to go. Uh, with that, we're on to uh, Agenda Item 5, Fishery specifications for 2017, a familiar topic. Uh, this is a final action. Uh, we have slated 30 minutes for this action, and I have every hope and intention of staying well within that 30-minute time frame. This is an item carried over from the last board meeting in August. 
At that meeting, after a series of votes by the board on motions that did not carry, the board approved a motion to postpone the matter until the board's next meeting. When the motion to postpone was approved, the pending motion, which was the main motion, was to set the 2017 coastal tax for the Menhaden fishery at 225,456 metric tons, which would be a 20% increase over the current tax. Given the nature of the motion to postpone, no additional motion is needed to bring the main motion back before the board today, this being our next meeting. As such, it is now back and serves as our starting point. Before we re-engage in the spec setting process, we have a brief uh, technical committee report, which first refreshes the board on the projection runs for the 2017 specifications and then provides some updates on recruitment trends in the fishery in response to the board's request in August for additional information on that issue. For that report, we have our TC chair, uh, Jason McNamee, queued up and ready to go. So Jason, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so I've got a presentation here, uh, sorry, Jason McNamee, uh, Rhode Island uh, DEM Marine Fisheries. Um, so I've got a brief presentation here. I'm gonna hit uh, two slides on stock status. I'm gonna show you two tables on um, some of the projection information. So you'll have um, 5,000 numbers bouncing around your head again. We can come back to any of these slides at any point. Uh, if people need them when you get into your deliberations. So with that, I will jump right in. Uh, the first slide here is on uh, current stock status with regard to fishing mortality. And you can see from this slide that we are both below the target and the threshold for fishing mortality. Uh, for Menhaden, this is of course generated from the last um, stock assessment. The next slide is the, this is actually fecundity, but that's like our biomass proxy for Menhaden. Um, and here you can see we're above the threshold and we're bouncing around the target up there at the top. So um, summation of those two slides is that stock status is in uh, pretty good shape right now. The board had us uh, run a number of projections. This first table here was a set of um, increases to the current tax. So that first row um, was what the current tax was in the previous year. And then a, a series of increases from that. So 5%, 10%, 20, 30, 40. And so you can see uh, how the tax increases as you go down the rows. Um, just to the right of the tax column is the risk of exceeding the F target and then to the right of that is the risk of exceeding the F threshold. And uh, perhaps not shockingly, as you go up in TAC, the risk of exceeding the F target increases. Um, but for all of these runs that we did, the risk of exceeding the F threshold was uh, 0%. And the next table was another uh, series of projections that were requested. Uh, same setup for this table. Uh, these were probabilities of uh, being below the F target um, and different levels of risk. So a 50%, 55%, and a 60% uh, probability of being below the F target in 2017. You can see the tax that are associated with those risk levels. Um, and since we had set them to uh, be at these uh, risk proportions, that's uh, just a little math there. But again, all the way to the right, the risk of exceeding the F threshold for these projections uh, was zero. Uh, the next couple of slides, this is, um, I'll call it uh, TC fine print for projections. Um, there's a lot of caveats, a lot of assumptions that go into projections. They are highly uncertain. Uh, Really quickly, I'm actually not going to dig into these too much. I, I've showed them to you, me personally, to this board uh, probably 10 times over the past few years. Um, so there's no structural uncertainty incorporated. Um, there's a lot of functional forms, like things like recruitment, um, that condition the projection model. Um, the allocations are assumed to be 
carried forward and what we mean by that is the amount of fish that are being used in these two fishery sectors bait and reduction uh, we assume that those carry forward and that has a lot to do with the selectivity uh, and where these fish are being taken for these different fisheries um, and then I think this is a final slide on this um, if there's a, a run of poor recruitment or um, anything like that that can affect the outcome of these projections um, and the projections apply the burnoff catch equation and so this is assuming a couple of different things such as catches occurring throughout the year not during specific seasons so anything that changes that would change the outcome of the projections okay um, at the August meeting uh, when you were deliberating on the TAC for 2017 um, one of the things that uh, had come up during your discussions was uh, a request to look at recruitment trends and I think what folks were asking for specifically was can you get us an updated recruitment trend uh, you know for our next meeting so unfortunately recruitment is a it's generated by the BAM model it's not um, something that can be easily done um, that would take a full update and uh, we of course did not have time to do that so we are trying to think what else we might be able to provide you to give you some kind of information and what we came up with was um, a series of juvenile abundance indices that uh, we kind of collect and look at um, and they're they're from up and down the coast and so that's what um, I'm going to show you in the next series of slides it's just some graphs of uh, abundance indices and these are specific to young of the year indices so we ended up getting eight indices from six different states uh, that were able to be updated in time for this meeting um, and these indices are presented in an attempt to provide the board with some information on the juvenile portion of the main Manhattan population so I'm gonna click now through these indices but then I've got some more TC fine print for you at the back end so um, bear with me on that so the first one is the Rhode Island SANE survey this is uh, in the northern extent of the stock and you can see there's a period of low recruitment in the late 80s then a period of kind of higher variable recruitment there as you got around the year 2000 um, drop back down again and then we had a couple of good years these past uh, two years in particular uh, in 2015 uh, information from Connecticut this is also a SANE survey this is from the Connecticut River um, it's Connecticut's not too far away from Rhode Island so not shockingly a similar trend there uh, with 2014 and 2015 having some high um, high recruitment numbers another Connecticut SANE survey this one in the Thames River a little bit further to the east in Long Island Sound um, a little bit diff different information a shorter time series as well though so that those kind of high years are coincident with the higher years from uh, Rhode Island and uh, the other Connecticut survey and then it kind of drops down and then 2014 and 2015 are higher than it had been although it didn't reach the peaks that you saw in the previous couple of slides uh, one more from Connecticut this is uh, from the trawl survey um, I believe this is uh, truncated to just the young of the year information uh, and again you can see at the tail end of the time series which I think is what people are most interested in uh, a couple of uh, above at well one average and one above average um, recruitment um, numbers there okay New York saying survey uh, again a period of higher abundance and variability for juveniles in the New York uh, area I believe this is the Western Long Island Sound SANE survey um, and then it kind of drops down and then 2014 and 2015 you had some higher numbers Delaware so now we're moving a little further south and what you see from Delaware is kind of a different signal a lot of variability pretty flat overall um, you had a, a pretty big spike there in the early 90s maybe another period of higher abundance above average anyways um, towards 2000 but it's been basically oscillating around the average um, since uh, about 2000 okay the Maryland SANE survey this one goes back uh, further it has a longer time series than what I've been showing you so far 
Uh, this one goes back to 1959. So in early uh, in the early part of the time series pretty low and then you had this really productive high juvenile period um, in the 70s and the early 80s and then it kind of tails off and what you see is um, from about 1995 uh, to present it's been uh, pretty low recruitment uh, in the Maryland area and this is the Virginia um, saying so Early on in the time series, much shorter time series than we just looked at, uh, you had some high uh, catch per haul um, uh, numbers, and then it kind of drops down. You had a, a little spike up there in 2010, but it's been uh, pretty low relative to those higher years. Okay, so that, that was all of the uh, indices that we had available to us. Uh, we hope that that was helpful for you, gives you some information on um, at least, you know, the last couple of years. Um, but a couple of things from the TC. We wanted to highlight that these indices do not provide a comprehensive picture of juvenile abundance along the coast. They are very specific and particular SANE surveys. If anyone's familiar, you kind of roll up to a beach and it's a very small um, sample in a very specific area. I have to assume that most of them are all fixed station. Um, surveys and so this is not a comprehensive picture of juvenile abundance so there's a reason why we do big complex stock assessments you can kind of synthesize a lot more information to give you a, a clearer picture so as a result of that the TC is not able to provide a, a statement a very direct statement on recruitment in 2015 um, nor are we able to predict the magnitude of the young of the year population to in 2015 so you know there was some blips up uh, in 2014, 2015, but how that ends up translating into the population, you need to run a stock assessment to determine that. So uh, that is all I have on that, and I'm happy to take any questions. I've got a couple other slides, but I can just pop them up if, um, if the information is asked for as the deliberations start. Awesome. Thanks, Jason. Questions for Jason? Yes, in the back. Yes, thanks, Jason, for your presentation. Um, did you graph all of those individual indices onto a single graph? Uh, no, we did not. Would, could you draw any conclusions from any trends that you saw from those individual states' indices? Yeah, I, so I mean, as far as what the indices were doing, there's certainly a, a block to the north where you had kind of consistent signals uh, that early 2000 period and then at the tail end you had um, you know what looked like a pretty healthy recruitment event um, I will offer that the signal is from Connecticut and Rhode Island and while we think they're uh, great and the, the biggest states in the nation they they are in fact a very small um, area along the coast so there there's a northern signal there in the most recent years but when you go to the south that signal um, was not as uh, clear or, or there at all. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, Wilson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Jason, does the technical committee, have you all looked at the, the areas, the estuarine areas that constitute nursery area for Menhaden, and can you give us a sense of where most of those lie geographically? I mean, you, you just referenced the, fa the fact, excuse me, that some of the areas up north where we're seeing a strong positive signal are relatively small. Um, I'm guessing that, you know, areas like Chesapeake Bay and Pamlico Sound, Albemarle Sound would be, you know, much larger in extent. It, it, historically, where's most of the recruitment come from geographically, I guess, is what I'm asking. Yeah. Sure. Um, so I, I would um, suggest that in general what is believed, it, it's sort of recorded in most of our um, stock assessment reports and things like that. Uh, the southern areas, Chesapeake Bay, uh, North Carolina areas, those are the, um, believed to be, you know, the, certainly spatially uh, larger than the estuaries to the north, but those were the areas that were believed to produce the most, um, most Menhaden. And, uh, and so, you know, that's kind of the answer to your question. And, and just to offer a little more insight into what it looks like in the northern areas, so the Rhode Island survey, that's Narragansett Bay. 
um, you know, small estuary in the north, and then you've got the estuaries of the Thames and the Connecticut River within Long Island Sound is where that other information was coming from. New York, um, that western Long Island Sound um, SANE survey, that's kind of tucked in, and I think it sort of straddles, um, you know, that Hudson area both inside Long Island Sound and, and just outside. Uh, but again, when you put those in the context of something like Chesapeake Bay, they're all very small estuaries. Go ahead, Wilson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Follow up. So looking at the Chesapeake Bay Index that you showed for Maryland, I think, and looking back into the 70s and 80s and seeing bars that appeared to be considerably taller than those that we have today, and trying to put that in context of statements to the effect that the, the stock is in really good shape, um, it appears that historically there was a, a much higher level of recruitment. So does the TC have any thoughts on those historic levels of recruitment versus today's levels of recruitment versus the present SSB? I mean, are, are we not seeing, you know, the positive signal that we should see in those much larger southern estuaries relative to uh, what the present spawning stock biomass is? And again, trying to put that in some sort of historical context here. Yeah, I, I'm not going to go too far down that road because uh, I don't. We had um, a lot of discussion on that during the stock assessment uh, discussion. So um, I, I think your observation that the recruitment in that very important uh, estuary uh, in the Mid Atlantic has been low, that certainly talked about a lot. Um, but there's different signals in some of the other estuaries uh, up and down the coast, and it, and it depends on the year as well. Bill Adler. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm, it's curious that uh, the northern ones are tending up. And I, as you just said, uh, they're, they're not a big area that you like they are down further south. And further south, they all seem to be just sort of there. They're not going up at all. And I wonder why. Um, is the northern statistics that you get that show that they're up in Connecticut and Rhode Island, is that like a fluke, and I don't mean summer flounder, uh, is that like a fluke issue or because it wasn't there before? I mean, any reason why it would be better up there than down mid-Atlantic? Yeah, no, it's a great question, probably a million dollar question. Um, it, we've seen this variability through time though where um, you know, I can speak directly about Rhode Island where we get these big pulses of peanuts uh, in Narragansett Bay and it happens, you know, one year, two years, and then they kind of disappear. And you, you actually see that in the information. Um, why that happens, you know, the in environmental conditions line up and these environmental conditions can be all sorts of things, wind currents advecting eggs into the bays, um, temperature, you know, whatever it is, a fish passing by at just the right time, you know, there's probably a, a million variables there. Um, but it's not uh, an uncommon thing. It happens periodically, and you can sort of see that in the time series. Any other questions for Jason? Yes, Rob O'Reilly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Jason. And I certainly understand your last slide about the technical committee uh, talking of being limited and the, this data set really is limited as well and I don't know the machinations of the uh, Beaufort assessment model but you do um, so my question is based on what the benchmark did how would you characterize these uh, surveys that you just presented um, in terms of their impact on the status of the stock and that might be a tough thing to think about without everything available to you, but uh, nonetheless, I want to ask that question. Yeah, and, uh, um, I appreciate the question. I'm going to dance around it a little bit. I hope you don't mind, because I, I don't know the answer. Um, the, in fact, there there's a multi-layered uh, 
approach to how that information even goes into the stock assessment. We do a, a hierarchical model on all of the juvenile abundance indices, and then they kind of go in as an aggregated index. Um, and so, it, you know, there's no way to be able to predict just by looking at some information, some noisy information in, in some cases, how it's going to translate into population information uh, out the end of the pipe. So um, it's nothing I can even conjecture about. Rob, quick follow? Very quick. So in the uh, BAM model, there's a weighting scheme as well for these indices? That's correct. We use a, there's a Bayesian hierarchical approach that weights them based on their variability. Any other questions? Seeing none. Thank you, Jason. Appreciate the report and the uh, responses to the, what were a series of good questions. Okay, now it's time to pick up where we left off on the setting of specifications for the 2017 fishery. Let me uh, attempt to set the stage and uh, go so far as to offer a recommended strategy forward. From a parliamentary perspective, the board may proceed today as it sees fit. The board may propose amendments to the main motion and such amendments may be different than or identical to the amendments offered at the last meeting. That said, because this matter was vetted extensively at our last meeting, I suggest that it would behoove the board to avoid retreading the same bumpy ground that we covered in August and focus instead on reaching a final decision toot sweet, or at least uh, tooter and sweeter than attempted uh, in August. Um, allow me to offer a recommended strategy that I think can get us to a final decision today in a way that's both fair and direct. Fair in that it will enable all board members to cast votes that are generally consistent with their perspectives on what the 2017 tax should be, and direct in that the final decision can be reached via three votes. My strategy is based on the recognition derived from the discussion, motions, and votes taken at the August meeting that the board essentially has three options. The first is a relatively large increase to the TAC. The second is a relatively modest increase to the TAC. And the third is status quo, that is maintaining the 2017 TAC at its current level. The distinction between a large and modest increase can be parsed ad infinitum as revealed at our August meeting, but I sense that there's little interest in re-engaging in such parsing today. So I'd like to proceed as follows. We will start with the main motion, which I'd like to ask staff to put back up on the screen from our August meeting. That is the proposed 20% increase. Based on the discussion, motions, and votes taken at that August meeting, it seems evident that the board views 20% as a relatively large increase. I will reopen board deliberation on the issue momentarily by entertaining a motion to amend. If anyone on the board wishes to move to amend by proposing a relatively modest increase to the TAC, that is something less than 20%, I would welcome that. If such a motion is made and receives a second, I will afford some brief, very brief discussion, and then we will vote on the motion. That vote should be viewed solely as a vote on whether the board supports a relatively large increase or a relatively modest increase to the TAC. If the motion passes, it will become the main motion. If it fails, the proposed 20% increase will remain as the main motion. Regardless of the outcome of that vote, I will then entertain another motion to amend. If anyone on the board wishes to move to amend by proposing status quo, that is a zero increase to the TAC, I would welcome that. If such a motion is made and receives a second, I will allow for some additional brief discussion and then we will vote. That vote will be a straight up or down vote on whether the board supports increasing the TAC or not increasing the TAC. If the motion passes, it will become the main motion. If it fails, the proposed 20% increase will remain as the main motion. And at that point, I will be very in inclined to entertain a final vote on the main motion, whatever that may be. And then we will be done. I do not intend to provide for any additional public input since we had extensive input on the same matter at our last meeting. Now, if any board member wishes to pursue a different course of action, for example, by moving to amend in some other way, that can happen and the process can go on and on and on. 
but my hope is that the board will see fit to proceed in the manner just described. So with that and with the main motion up on the screen and back before the board, I will now entertain a motion to amend. Dr. Rhodes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for all the information earlier. I move to amend the motion to set the 2017 coastal total allowable catch for Atlantic Menhaden at 200,000 metric tons. And if I get a second, I'd just like to speak briefly. Uh, moved by Dr. Rhodes and seconded by Terry Stockwell. Uh, Dr. Rhodes, uh, let's make sure we have the motion up correctly. And I'd be curious, and I think it might be helpful to know what percent increase that 200,000 metric ton represents. Uh, I don't know if Megan has that immediately available. Maybe we'll get to that um, after you present your, your uh, comments. So Dr. Rhodes, to you. Since we're in Maine, I will try to follow our late leader, George LaPointe's uh, brevity being next to cleanliness, being next to godliness remarks. At the last meeting, we had very good discussion with the pros and cons of remaining at status quo or raising this. And this small tyrant fish obviously creates a lot of emotion in people. We went through a series just to remind the board very quick, quickly of not voting for status quo 1%, 5%, 10%, and 19% increases. During the course of that motion, uh, of those actions, between the 5% and the 10%, there seemed to be a shift in several of the states, which made me believe that if we had a uh, removal that was somewhere in that area in 200,000 metric tons is 6.5%. Um, that that seems to be a, uh, an area that most of the states could work at. Um, it's not going to be what some states want, and it's obviously not what other states want, but we are <coughs> of necessity, we must create uh, a attack for this species. As Mr. Uh, Goldsboro very well pointed out at the last meeting where we got to this point, as we're trying to get to Amendment 3 and to get to the multi-species, we created a two-year attack and we had no fallback position at that. If we do not create attack at this meeting, it's undefined, which to me means unlimited. So it's my hope that we can support this motion, go on to Amendment 3, and then, as we were informed earlier over the next two or three years, be able to look at this instead of a single species fishery, a multi-species uh, fishery. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm game to take some very limited discussion on this. My preference would be two uh, who are opposed to the motion and, and another uh, who would be in support. So uh, we just heard from the maker of the motion. I'd now like to see by a show of hands, is there anyone who would like to speak in opposition to the motion? And I'd like to just take two. So who might be the lucky two? And if not, I'd be game to take uh, another comment in support of the motion. And I would just like to take one additional comment. Terry, you were the seconder, so the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I surely appreciate the approach that you, you've you taken the, uh, to the board today. I think we have a good chance of getting through the afternoon, but, but like most everybody else around the table, I lost track of the number of motions we made in August. Uh, but my sense is, is that um, the motion on the board of 6.5% is a workable compromise to move us ahead in 2017. Well, this, this, this percentage or any other increase and quota does absolutely nothing for the state of Maine. Um, uh, it modestly <laughs> acknowledges the current status of stock while, uh, while we focus our collective time on the development and implementation of the, of the much needed reallocation of the Manhattan stock in Amendment 3. So I st strongly support the motion. Thank you. I'm inclined to take just a couple of more comments on this. I did see Michelle's hand up, and I saw one other hand up, uh, and I, that would be Rob. So I'll take two those two comments. I'd then like to have this voted upon, and then there will be an additional opportunity for comment if and when there's a subsequent motion, which I anticipate there will be. So for now, Dr. Duval. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for allowing me the opportunity to speak. I will be brief. Um, I am speaking in support of the motion. I will note that there has been a lot of conversation about this back home. And for the record, I would like to note that the department does support an increase of up to 10 percent for the 2017 TAC. Thank you. Thank you. Rob? Um, I would say the comments of Malcolm were were very good, and Virginia is not alone. There are some states who um, are before now looking forward to having the baseline where it really was before the 20 percent reduction. However, I think there's an acute awareness of everyone looking down to Amendment 3 and that process. And so with that, um, Virginia does support the motion. Thank you. Thank you. So with that, I'm going to call for a vote on the motion to amend. It's been requested that every vote on these uh, proposed amendments uh, shall be roll call votes. So I will be calling upon Megan momentarily to call the roll. Keep in mind that there will be an opportunity, I'm just reiterating now, immediately following this vote to offer a status quo proposal. This vote, sh so therefore this vote should be viewed solely as a reflection of the board's preference for either a relatively large increase to the TAC reflected by a no vote on the motion or a relatively modest increase to the TAC reflected by a yes vote on the motion. I'll allow for a 30 second caucus. Okay, is the board ready? If so, I'd like to have Megan call the roll going south to north. <laughs> Florida. That surprised me. Uh, yes. <laughs> Georgia. Okay, that threw us for a loop. <laughs> yes. South Carolina. Aye. North Carolina. Yes. Virginia. Yes. Potomac River. Yes. Maryland. Yes. Delaware. Yes. Pennsylvania. Yes. New Jersey. Yes. New York. Yes. Connecticut. Yes. Rhode Island. Yes. Massachusetts. Yes. New Hampshire. Yes. Maine. Maine votes yes. NIMS. Yes. U.S. Fish and Wildlife. Yes. The motion passes unanimously. It now becomes the main motion. Would anyone else on the board like to offer any other motions to amend? Bill Goldsboro. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Anticipating this opportunity, I didn't raise my hand a moment ago. I feel like maybe I should have, but um, I'd like to, uh, for the consideration of the board, offer uh, a motion to amend um, to set the 2017 coastal total allowable catch for Atlantic Menhaden uh, at um, the current level, which I believe is 187,000 metric tons. Yes, we'll put the exact number up, but I understand the nature of your motion is a motion to amend to keep the 2017 spec at the at status quo, the current level. Is there a second to that? Seconded by Richie White. Bill, would you like to speak to your motion? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, we should not be at this point is the first thing I want to say. It was not our intent. Uh, the current science before us is uh, the benchmark assessment reported to this board a year ago in the spring. Uh, at that time, we deliberated long and hard, and we took action. We, we took two primary actions. The first one was uh, we increased the quota for 2015 and 2016 by 10 percent. 
<clears throat> the second thing we did was we decided to develop a new plan, Amendment 3, to take effect in 2017. There was a sequence in mind there. Uh, and that had two major elements to it that addressed two major problems that we knew we had. The first one was um, the commitment that this board, this commission, made 15 years ago to uh, account for Menhaden's ecological role. Uh, and that would be done through the development of ecological reference points um, to be adopted in Amendment 3. The second was to revisit allocation. Uh, because as we have experienced since the quota was put in place in 2013, uh, we either chose the wrong baseline period, we didn't have enough data in some states, or whatever the reason, we know that a number of states were shortchanged, and that caused a lot of problems. Uh, so we, um, in many states, we, we want to address those problems any way we can. I understand that. Um, but later last year, Actually, with that in mind, we considered that we had a socioeconomics study we were undertaking to inform that decision making uh, in Amendment 3. Uh, and we realized at the annual meeting a year ago that that was going to take us a year. Uh, and we decided that it'd be better to have that in hand when we had the discussion of a new allocation framework. Um, and so we pushed back the timeline for Amendment 3 by a year to 2018. And that, just by chance, opened up next year, 2017, as a year that we had not specified would be at the same quota level as we had set for 2015 and 16. And I think that was just by chance. I think our intent all along was to keep the quota at that level after we had fully vetted that assessment and decided a 10 percent increase was appropriate, uh, keep it at that level until we adopted Amendment 3. I think we should stay that course. I think that is good management. Uh, I know that um, we do want to address the shortfalls in the bait industry. To me, that is one of our highest priorities, especially in the small-scale states, and that's most of us. Uh, I don't think by increasing under the current allocation framework, we're going to do much toward that end. I don't think we're going to make much difference. Uh, instead, I think what we're going to do is uh, preempt what progress we could really make uh, under a more fair and balanced allocation framework in Amendment 3. Uh, so uh, I would urge us to uh, keep that in mind and um, uh, wait, hold, keep our powder dry. Um, I would also like to say that uh, a lot of people are distilling down the circumstance we're in right now as being one in which the science recommends an increase. Uh, one speaker earlier actually even said the TC recommended an increase, and I think that's in error. Um, the TC did projections for us to inform our decision making on an increase. And they are pretty compelling projections, I have to admit. Um, but we need to keep in mind they are based on that same assessment. They aren't new science. They're based on that assessment that we've already made a judgment on um, and, and the uh, reference points in that assessment. And those reference points are single species reference points. They uh, do not take into account uh, all the needs of the ecosystem the way we want to do in the ecological reference points. In fact, a year ago at the annual meeting, we considered a motion to divert from the course of Amendment 3 and undertake an addendum to make those reference points the ones we would use going forward. We voted that motion down. We decided to stay the course at that point because we did believe that it was the best way to address those fundamental problems that we have. Ecological reference points to deal fully with, with the issue we committed to 15 years ago and a new allocation framework that would be fair to all the states, especially the small-scale bait states where there really is a need. Uh, so 
At this point, this accidental circumstance we find ourselves in, uh, in which there's a lot of talk about how there are more fish out there, and it seems like there are. But that's not science. That's not a survey that's verifying that. That's anecdote, very compelling, I would admit. But this commission has always shied away from making management judgments based on anecdote, always. That goes way back. Um, and with respect to the needs of certain states, we've been uh, trying to meet those over the last couple of years with uh, some sharing of quota between states with the um, episodic um, event option. Um, and uh, and, and I, I would hope that we could just go one more year getting by doing that um, and have a real thorough resolution of these issues the way we set out to do it just last year. Um, and not make a decision now based on to overstate it, perhaps, uh, anecdote and expediency. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, show of hands, those with a burning desire to speak in opposition to the motion. One, two, three, four, five. I'll take those five comments. Actually, leave your hands up. Uh, Megan, can you uh, note those, please? Um, keep your hands up. I'm going to take those five. And then I'll take um, four others who wish to speak. You can put your hands down. Those four others who would like to speak in support. Nicola, um, Andy, uh, Wilson, and Robert. Uh, let me, I'm sorry, let me go back to uh, in opposition. We had, uh, who was in opposition? So we'll start with Bill Adler. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, <clears throat> I, I speak in, in opposition to this uh, amend, proposed amendment. I'm looking at a lot of issues here. First of all, the science basically has said there's no risk. Science says the stock is in good shape. Sometimes I find it difficult that we can deal with overfishing, uh, overfished, overfishing. We can do a very good job of cutting things down. Then we have a success model and we don't know what to do with it. Uh, we can't deal with success maybe. Now I agree that Amendment 3 is necessary and needed and should be uh, done, but not till 2018. Meanwhile, what's being proposed here is a small increase. And I don't see the problem with the stock. I don't see the problem with bumping it up similar to the 6.45 percent. I wouldn't go cog wild. I wouldn't go to 20. But um, the 6.45 shows that the stock is okay. It's good. We have success. Uh, it won't help Massachusetts very much. Uh, if we do go up, but still, in fairness to the entire Menhaden system, I think that um, it deserves to be able to be bumped up a little, and then when Amendment 3 comes through, uh, we could do other types of changes. But I, I, waiting till 2018 to do anything, I don't think it's necessary for that. So I'm, I'm in opposition to this particular motion to amend. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Uh, next, I have Andy Shields. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll be very brief. Um, when you think about this is an investment in the environment, it's an investment in the ocean, it's an investment in the communities up and down the coast, it's an investment in the, the folks who have never seen Menhaden in their waters at the, the extreme ends of the range. Um, when you make investments, any wise investor has a nest egg or has a, a principal, you not spend your dividends on your principal the first year to get dividends. Most people in a wise investment strategy take their time, they look at the long view, and they reinvest those dividends. And I think all that's being asked here is to reinvest the dividends of what looks to be uh, a year of some increased uh, abundance of Menhaden into the long-term picture. 
I, was, I wasn't here when you created the plan and the, the process you're working on now, which is a three-year plan in the process. You set forth on a process, what is, the, what is the urgency to depart from that process all of a sudden so you can spend your dividend? And I think I, we're talking about success. Your best chance of success of making that plan that you've put forward happen is to ensure that you give it the time to build the stock, which is what you're doing right now. You're going to have a good stock to work with to set your ecological reference points and to reset your allocation process. You're going to have a bigger pie or a bigger pot when the reallocation discussions happen in a year or so than you will now. And you won't have lost the ground that you've gained in the past year or two when you get into that ERP process and the, um, the reallocation process. So I guess to summarize, I would say have patience. You put together a good plan, stay the course, and allow your investment to pay off when the time is right. Thank you. Thank you. Adam Nawalski. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to <coughs> briefly speak in opposition to the motion to amend. I'm going to speak in opposition to the motion to amend. Uh, I'll start by beginning with Mr. Goldsboro, our recent Hart Award recipient, and agreeing with him that we don't respond anecdotally. We respond based on science. And going back to our last meeting, the question was asked of the TC chair, can you let us know when the last time every run you did for a species generated a 0% chance of overfishing? And the answer from our technical chair was, I think the answer is, I don't know that I've ever experienced that personally. Responding to the science here would be an increase. Now, I'm also going to have to take the opportunity to disagree with the assertion that we are debating between a moderate increase, because what we're really looking at here is a relatively small number. A large increase would be the 40 percent number that still generates a 0 percent probability of overfishing. A moderate increase would be the 20 percent number we started the discussion with. 6.45 percent is a very small number. And I encourage this body to vote against the motion to amend and vote in favor of the motion that's the original motion at this point. Thank you. Thank you. Nicola Meserve. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, consistent with the remarks of Dr. Pierce at the last board meeting, uh, DMF continues to support status quo, uh, prefer status quo uh, for the Menhaden TAC for next year. A um, couple reasons, um, as already stated by Bill, Bill Goldsboro, we uh, prefer to have the TAC reevaluated in light of the 2017 stock assessment um, and also paired with possible reallocation in 2018. Um, the 10 percent increase uh, was already based on the 2015 assessment results that had a terminal year of 2013. The technical committee hasn't been able to provide us with clear uh, guidance on the uh, juvenile recruitment since then. Um, in Massachusetts, we see that Menhaden are still regaining their full range. Um, while there were reports of Menhaden being more abundant south of Cape Cod, uh, that was not uniformly so north of Cape Cod and only for one year. Uh, the TC may have demonstrated that there is no coastwide risk of overfishing from the uh, analyzed options, but uh, there may be a regional cost to, in the northeast of increasing exploitation given our geographical position in the species range. Um, a wide age structure and a high population size promotes uh, the migration of Menhaden to New England waters. Um, so again, we prefer to stay the course for 2017 and wait until 2018. Thank you. Thank you. Next I have Kyle Schick. Thank you very much. The history that was given earlier was, was a little brief. We need to really go back to where we uh, needlessly cut 20 percent on bad science, on a knee-jerk reaction that was motivated by politics. So that's where it really starts. And then we get good science and we bring back 10 percent, which was still way lower than it could be. The rumors of increased stock and 
juvenile, you know, increases. It's not being overfished. It never has been overfished. Overfishing has never occurred since we've been talking about this. No other stock have we ever talked about have we've had the luxury of complaining about trying to reduce a mortality on a fish that is not being overfished, that's not, uh, and overfishing's not occurred. We're arguing about something that doesn't occur here. And multi-species, hopefully we'll get that in 2018. We don't know what's gonna come. We're gonna put out two different multi-species um, scenarios along with a single species scenario. We're gonna put it out to public. You know, to hear some people in this room, it's a foregone conclusion that we're gonna have to decrease the tack from multi-species uh, approach. We don't know that. We have no science that says that. Tack is what we can do today with the information we have today, which is the best information we've had on Menhaden in the history of tracking it. And, and a 6.5% increase is minuscule. I agree, we should be up to 10% or 15% and we could solve everybody's problem. But we've come to the point where we're, you know, hopefully be able to compromise on a 6.5% and help some folks out, get some more fish, and, uh, and see how things go for next year. And that's what we should be doing and I support. The uh, not, well, I'm in, not in favor of this motion, for sure. Thank you. Uh, Wilson Laney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> I certainly support uh, the comments by Mr. Goldsboro, by Mr. Shields, and Ms. Meserve. I would encourage us to think about the fact that we're not just talking Menhaden here. We're talking an entire ecosystem. And while we don't have all the insights we would like to have about the forage needs of the rest of the ecosystem for Menhaden, I think we can all acknowledge that Menhaden is one of the principal prey species that is used by other ASMFC and council managed species, such as striped bass, which is sort of our flagship species, as well as weak fish, as well as bluefish. If you think about that juvenile abundance series for the bay that Jason projected a while ago and look at the 1970 and 1980 levels and note that there hasn't been an uptick in the what is probably one of the principal Menhaden nursery areas on the east coast along with Pamlico Sound probably to the south. There have been some positive signals to the north, but we still don't see a positive signal in that southern area. And I also think about the fact that we have striped bass diseases that have manifested themselves in recent years, that we have striped bass that are showing low, lower condition factors than striped bass from a decade or two ago, um, and that we also have diet studies which show us that striped bass are now more reliant on smaller, less nutritious species like bay anchovies uh, as opposed to Atlantic menhaden. So for all of those reasons, I think the prudent course of action is to maintain status quo until we get the results of the socioeconomic study until we have generated some ecological reference points, until we get the results of multi-species modeling so we have more information in front of us before we uh, issue any increase in the TAC. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, David Bush. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, no disrespect to the folks that have spoke before me, and I apologize. I'm, I'm coming into this after having someone that I, I replaced from your last meeting, but I'd like to point out that the 2014-2018 strategic plan identified eight values to guide this body's operations and activities, and I'd like to point two of them out. Timely response to new information through adaptive management. I mean, that's something you want, you hear that constantly from fishermen. And also balancing resource conservation with the economic success of coastal communities. Well, I can certainly appreciate the perspective of those in the farther reaches of this species range, 
the effort in this fishery is and has been well below half, actually around one quarter of its peak for quite some time. I'm aware that it's a forage fish and not to imply that there was absolutely no impact by those peak levels of effort, but we still have those that rely on it for forage even after decades, almost a century even, of a major reduction fishery. The stock appears to be expanding and that is a good thing for the ecosystem. I have, however, not seen any scientific evidence pre presented at this point that even suggests that a reasonable increase would put this expansion in jeopardy. What we do have is solid science that supports an increase of up to 40%. Of those of I have spoken to, in order to better understand the viewpoints, it seems that there is substantial support for an increase, but it's the value of that increase that's in question. I feel that we should be discussing the scientifically supported impacts of a 20% increase. But after having spoken to the fishermen and others in the industry, as well as those that generally do not support an increase, I think we could find a middle ground of sufficient support at the 10% level that accomplishes our goals. I understand that that is not your amended main motion up there, but quibbling over the difference between 10% and 200,000 metric tons for the sake of having a round number uh, is nonsense. We don't manage fisheries with the goal of having round numbers. That being said, we're still discussing a small percentage increase based on landings from a fishery that is a shadow of its former self, not a percentage of its peak harvest numbers when dependent predators may have been impacted. The best available science, which appears to be very solid, says an increase in this range is safe and has a 0% chance of causing an overfishing situation. Why wait for it to be addressed in the next action in some respect in Amendment 3, which is not expected to be effective before sometime in 2018? Our fishermen want stability tempered with some level of adaptability. An increase at this point is scientifically supported and would by no means be a knee-jerk reaction. Otherwise, when would the science ever be good enough to support an increase? The other argument concerning allocation is a completely different discussion that will be addressed. Keep in mind that the TAC is the TAC regardless of who catches it. Having to fight for every single point of a justified increase is disappointing considering the Commission's stated values I mentioned earlier. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, remaining in the queue, I have uh, Rob O'Reilly in opposition, Robert Boyles in support, and there was one other hand that I had recognized in support, but I didn't get, get the name down. Did, was there someone else in support that had raised their hand who hasn't yet spoken? Is, then maybe I missed that. So let me go to um, uh, Rob O'Reilly uh, next. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I know we say we'll be brief, but I will be brief. <laughs> it, is, it is my hope that we don't prolong this need for bait needlessly. And it is certainly should be all of our hopes that no one has been shortchanged. If you think about it, the actions of this board, which were very well intended um, back through 2010, 2011, leading up to 2012, certainly aren't at fault, but everyone wants good science. We have good science. I contend that we brought this bait need onto ourselves with our actions, as well as the short change that is there. Uh, my desire is that we get back to the true baseline, the 212 plus thousand uh, metric tons, and that really that is the status quo to me. Um, and. That's really all I have, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Robert Boyles. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, many of you I, I spoke to the board um, in making the original motion back in August. I will do my best not to repeat uh, my interest in a status quo and my support of a status quo motion. Uh, I will say, um, you know, this is um, um, extraordinarily difficult. Um, I think it, uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you for the order within which you've brought us to these um, very deliberate discussions and conversations. Um, I think where uh, I'm going to go back to something that was said early on, um, you know, clearly a lot of people interested in this fishery, a lot of people interested in this resource, uh, a lot of communities dependent upon this resource. Um, my support for a status quo for 2017 um, really stems from a, a hopeful vision, if you will, Mr. Chairman, that, um, that with Amendment 3, um, that we can have a, um, a fishery um, that satisfies um, bait needs 
satisfies um, the, re the important reduction fishery, um, that satisfies the important um, ecosystem components of this fishery, um, and that has spillover effects to satisfy other species that uh, are important um, to this commission. Uh, I'm a little concerned, I guess I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm risk averse uh, in my interest uh, in, in maintaining status quo for the moment because I, I'm concerned that we, with a long view um, towards a final adoption of Amendment 3, um, that we may um, potentially find ourselves inadvertently into a game of regulatory whiplash. That's a phrase that's been used around this table more than once. And so um, I think status quo is a precautionary approach. I think it leaves us um, an ability to um, smooth out the bumps long term in the future of this fishery. And, uh, and for that reason, I support the motion. Thank you. Thank you. And with that, I'm going to call for a vote on this motion. Uh, I'll allow uh, for a one-minute caucus. Okay, is the board ready to vote? Let's be ready to vote and let me call for, uh, Megan to call the roll moving north to south. Changing it up here. Maine. Maine votes no. New Hampshire. Yes. Massachusetts. Yes. Rhode Island. No. Connecticut. Yes. New York. No. New Jersey. No. Pennsylvania. Yes. Delaware. No. Maryland. No. Potomac River. No. Virginia. No. North Carolina. No. South Carolina. Yes. Georgia. Yes. Florida. Yes. Nymphs. No. U.S. Fish and Wildlife. Yes. The motion fails, eight in favor, 10 opposed. Uh, therefore, the motion on the board remains the main motion. I am prepared to now call for a final vote uh, on this main motion. Uh, and if the board is comfortable with that, I uh, would like to go right to that vote. I don't know if there's any need to caucus. Uh, this would be the final vote on the main motion to set the 2017 uh, fishery specifications for Menhaden. Uh, so with that, I'll ask Megan to call the roll and we'll go north to south again. Maine. Maine votes yes. New Hampshire. Yes. Massachusetts. Yes. Rhode Island. Yes. Connecticut. Yes. New York. Yes. 
New Jersey. Yes. Pennsylvania. No. Delaware. Yes. Maryland. Yes. Potomac River. Yes. Virginia. Yes. North Carolina. Yes. South Carolina. Yes. Georgia. Yes. Florida. Yes. NIMS. Yes. U.S. Fish and Wildlife. No. So, 16 to 2. The motion passes 16 to 2. Thank you very much. Uh, good work on that, and I think we uh, covered that issue well over the course of two meetings. Um, let's just take a two-minute break to stretch, uh, then we'll come back and, and take on the uh, Draft Amendment 3 PID. Uh, back in three minutes. One minute, one minute, then we'll resume. Okay, if everybody could please work your way back to your seats. I'd like to resume. Okay, please take your seats. We've got a lot of work to do, and it's 4 o'clock. Okay, I'm going to call the meeting back to order. We are on to item six on our agenda, which is the draft amendment three public information document, or PID. Uh, this is an action item. As Megan noted earlier during her review of the timeline, the board is poised today to formally launch the amendment three process via approval of this PID. 
The board briefly discussed an initial outline of the document at our August meeting and offered some preliminary comments. Additionally, the Menhaden Advisory Panel reviewed and commented on an early draft of the document, and some changes were made in response to those comments. The plan development team has, team has done an excellent job pulling everything together, resulting in the draft that's now before us. Our mission this afternoon is to work through the draft and finalize it so it can go out to public hearing over the next couple of months. For those members who may not be familiar with the amendment process, the PID represents the first formal step in the process. It is essentially a scoping document aimed at informing the development of the draft amendment via public input on the options to be considered in the draft amendment. In keeping with the purpose of Amendment 3, the PID essentially does two things. First, it scopes a suite of potential tools to manage the Menhaden resource using ecological reference points, or ERPs. Second, it scopes a suite of potential options for reconfiguring the methodology used to allocate the coastwide TAC. So here's how we plan to proceed on this agenda item. Megan will first give a presentation and answer any questions. It's about a 20-minute presentation. It runs through the entire document. Jeff Kalin will then summarize the AP report and answer any questions. I will then lead the board through the process of considering changes to the document. When we get to that point, I have some guidelines on the process I'd like to follow for considering and approving changes. Uh, we have a lot to get through. Uh, we've got an hour and 20 minutes set aside to get through this. Um, so with that lead in, uh, Megan, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right, so I'll be going through the management options in the PID for Amendment 3. Um, thank you. Um, the chairman actually did a really good job of going over what my first slide is here, but I'll just reiterate that the public information document is supposed to be a broad scoping document, and the purpose of this is to announce the commission's intent to gather information concerning Atlantic Menhaden and to provide the public with an opportunity to identify major issues or management alternatives. Um, this is in contrast to the draft amendment, which is a bit more narrow and specific. So I just wanted to kind of put that out there um, when we talk about um, how we got to where we are today on this PID. All right, so this is the timeline for the draft amendment. Again, I've already been through a timeline today, so I'm gonna be pretty brief here, um, but we are considering this for public comment. Um, if that is approved, our public comment period would be from November 2016 through January 2017. And again, looking long-term, we're hoping to take final action on Amendment 3 a year from now. So before you is a list of the issues currently included in the PID. Um, some of the names have changed, but the actual issues are still the same ones that were presented in August. So my plan for today's presentation is to go through each one of these issues, kind of give a brief overview of why it's included in the PID, and then I'll go through the management options or public comment questions that are associated with that issue. So we'll start with reference points. The stock is currently managed by single species reference points from the 2015 stock assessment, and those were intended to provide a better measure of sustainability in the fishery. The board has expressed an interest in managing the Atlantic Menhaden stock with ERPs, and currently the BURP working group is developing Menhaden specific ERPs, which will be peer reviewed in 2019. There are also existing guidelines for managing forage fish species that the board can look to in their consideration here. Uh, we have the 75% rule of thumb, which recommends that forage fish populations be maintained at three-fourths of their unfished biomass levels. We also have the LENFEST proposal by Pekitsch et al., which recommends that F does not exceed one half of natural mortality, and that fishing is prohibited when biomass falls below 40% unfished biomass. We also have a third ERP that's included here, and between Jeff and I, we'll hopefully be able to provide a bit of context as to how this was added. But this was recommended on the advisory panel call for inclusion in the PID. Um, it is, uh, so the actual reference point is F target to achieve a 75% unfished biomass, and that fishing is prohibited when biomass falls below 40% unfished biomass. And we'll put some more language up there to further clarify that. 
Um, but in the PDT's discussion of this, um, they decided to include it in the PID as another example of how forage fish can be managed. Um, and they also felt like it felt somewhere in the in the realm of the 75% rule of thumb and the LENFEST proposal. So it was kind of in the range of where we were speaking. Um, both Jeff and I will continue to discuss this and we'll be able to answer questions by the board um, to provide a little more context on that. So these are the current options for reference points. Option A is the single species reference points from the 2015 stock assessment. If the board directs the, uh, decides to use this option, um, the board would direct the BURP to stop work on Menhaden specific ERPs. Option B is to use existing guidelines for forage fish species. So this could include them, something like the 75% rule of thumb or the LENFEST proposal. Again, if this is chosen, the board would direct the BURP to stop work on Menhaden specific ERPs. Options C and D are the board agreeing to um, follow the BURP in their Menhaden specific ERPs. So option C is saying we're going to continue to use the single species reference points until those ERPs are developed by the BURP. And then option D says we're going to instead implement um, existing guidelines for forage fish species until those BURP uh, ERPs are developed. And again, those existing guidelines can include the 75% rule of thumb, the LENFEST proposal, or that new harvest uh, control rule. All right, our second issue is quota allocation. Amendment 2 established a TAC for Manhattan and divided this among the states. Um, and in revisiting this allocation, there are a couple of concerns that have come up. The first concern is that the current TAC may not strike a balance between gear types and regions. And this is posed a problem as we increase the TAC. Um, this seems to have limited benefit for small scale fisheries. Another concern is as the stock continues to expand and grow, especially in the Northeast, um, historical catch could limit states with minimal quota from participating in this growing fishery. As a result, the board has stated an interest in exploring other allocation strategies. And in May 2015, uh, there was an allocation working group established to try and address some of these issues. And the allocation options currently included in the document are from that work group. So we have quite a few quota allocation options. The first is jurisdictional allocation, which would be our status quo. Option B is jurisdictional allocation with fixed minimum quota. So an example here might be that each state gets 1% of the coastwide TAC and then the rest is distributed. Option C is a coastwide quota. Option D is a seasonal quota. Option E are regional quotas and we have sub options for either a two, three or four region split. Option F is disposition quota. So that would be between the bait and the reduction fisheries. Option G is a fleet capacity quota. And again, here we have sub options for a two fleet or three fleet option. I'll note here for the small fleets, um, there is an option for a soft quota to try and provide a bit more flexibility to those small scale fisheries. Intricately tied with the allocation method is the allocation time frame. And the question here is whether the current time frame represents a fair and equitable picture of coastwide menhaden catch. So we have three options here. Uh, option A is our status quo, so that's 2009 to 2011. Option B would be to expand that to a longer time series. And that can include um, adding 2012 uh, catch information, or it can mean going back further in time to 2005 or 1985. Um, so there's a large umbrella there of what that could mean. Option C is weighted allocation. So this uh, tries to consider long-term trends as well as recent changes in harvest. And so allocation would be, would be weighted over two time periods. Our next issue is quota transfers and overage payback. So Amendment 2 allows for quota transfers among jurisdictions. And just as a practical matter, transfers are a very useful way to address overages in the fishery. Um, however, the timing of some states may disadvantage them from being able to fully participate in this transfer process. And there's also no guidelines to what a state should do if they receive multiple requests at the same time. 
So we can try and look to other FMPs to see what they do for these issues. Um, if we look at some, such as the Black Sea Bass FMP, um, it allows for quota reconciliation, where if the coastwide TAC is not exceeded, state-specific overages are forgiven. It also provides examples of what to do when the coastwide TAC is exceeded, um, and in that case, um, if at least one state has an underage, then that state could transfer their unused quota to a common pool, and then that could be distributed to states with an overage. So for this issue, we have public comment questions, so I'm going to just read those off here. The four questions are, should the process for quota transfers be further defined or replaced with quota reconciliation? Should state-specific overages be forgiven in years when the coastwide TAC is not exceeded? If the coastwide TAC is exceeded, but at least one jurisdiction has an underage, should unused quota be pooled and distributed to states with an overage? Should there be accountability measures for a state which exceeds its quota by a certain percentage or repeatedly participates in quota reconciliation? Our next issue is quota rollovers. So Amendment 2 does allow for unused quota to be rolled over into the subsequent year if the stock is not overfished and overfishing is not occurring. Um, however, the specifics of that program were not defined in Amendment 2, and at the time of final action, we weren't meeting those criteria. Um, however, from the 2015 stock assessment, we now do meet that criteria, and so quota transfers or quota rollovers are allowed. However, those specifics were never defined, and so the board agreed to tackle this issue in Amendment 3. Again, here we have public comment questions. We have three of them. Should unused quota be rolled over into the subsequent year? If yes, should the amount rolled over be limited to a percent of quota? Should all sectors of the fishery be allowed to roll over quota? Our next issue is incidental catch and small-scale fisheries. Um, in August when I presented this, this was called bycatch. Um, the PDT decided to make a conscious choice to try and um, use incidental catch instead of bycatch, and there were a couple of reasons for that. Um, the first is we felt that there were a bunch of different uh, definitions of bycatch, and so we were getting a bit confused as to what we were actually talking about. Um, and really the intent of this is for incidental catch, and so we wanted to try and represent that in the PID. Um, so that's why you may see incidental catch more frequently in this document. So currently under Amendment 2, um, all catch goes towards the quota before a state reaches that quota, but once you reach that quota, your directed fishery shuts down and we move into a bycatch fishery. And the Amendment 2 established a bycatch allowance of 6,000 pounds per vessel per trip for these non-directed fisheries. Um, there are a couple of concerns that have come up with this allowance. The first concern is that bycatch um, under this allowance does not count towards the quota, and so there's some concern that this could undermine the coastwide tack that we set each year. There's also no definition of bycatch or non-directed fisheries provided, and so there's some questions of who should actually be allowed to participate in this allowance, and it's also raised concerns that the bycatch allowance may be supporting a small-scale fishery rather than incidental catch. There's also concern that the bycatch provision dissuades cooperative fishing, and so we tried to address this with Addendum 1, where we allowed two permitted individuals to land 12,000 pounds of Menhaden. However, there may be other ways to address this in a more holistic view through Amendment 3. So again, here we're back to management options. So option A would be our status quo, so that's a catch limit per vessel. Option B is an incidental catch limit per permitted individual. So the idea here is that this would try and solve the issue about cooperative fishing because the catch limit would be per person rather than per vessel. Option C is to have the incidental catch included in the quota. So incidental catch would count towards the quota, and once that quota is met, no landings would be allowed. Again, the idea here is to try and um, account for our incidental catch in the coastwide tax so we're not undermining um, that value. Option D is an incidental catch cap and trigger, so there would be a harvest cap for incidental catch, and if that is exceeded by a certain percentage in one year or two consecutive years, then management action would be triggered to reduce incidental catch. Option E is, an incidental catch, is that incidental catch be defined by a percent composition, so the amount you could land would depend on what else you're catching at that time. 
And then option F is for a small scale fishery set aside. So here a portion of the TAC would be set aside for gears participating in small scale fisheries. This is very similar to an option in the quota allocation issue, but the reason it's also included under this issue is that regardless of what allocation method the board chooses, there's still an option for a small scale fishery set aside um, to deal with some of the issues we're seeing in the bycatch fishery. All right, our next issue here is episodic events. So amendment two sets aside 1% of the TAC for episodic events. And then we had technical addendum one, which outlined the specifics of this program and specified that uh, participation in this program was for the New England states. Since 2013, we've seen an increasing amount of menhaded landed under this program, as well as increased participation from the states. So in 2014, only 8% of the set-aside was used. This year, so far, 92% of the set-aside has been used. Um, also this year, we had New York request and be approved to harvest under the episodic event program, um, even though they're not technically considered a New England state. And so this has prompted questions about the size and the geographic spread of the program. So we're back to public comment questions for episodic events. Our questions are, should a percentage of TAC be set aside for episodic events? If yes, what percentage of the annual TAC should be set aside? If yes, which jurisdiction should be allowed to participate in this program? Does the episodic event program need to be reconsidered as the distribution of Menhaden changes? How should states demonstrate that an episodic event is occurring in state waters? And our final issue here is the Chesapeake Bay reduction cap. So currently the Chesapeake Bay reduction fishery is limited by a harvest cap. And the intent of this harvest cap is to prevent all of the reduction fishery from occurring in the Chesapeake Bay, which is an important nursery ground for Menhaden. Um, however, the reduction fishery consistently underperforms this cap. And so it's raised questions uh, to whether this is really um, a vital tool to the management of Menhaden. So our two questions are, should the Chesapeake Bay reduction fishery cap be maintained? Is it an, import, is it an important tool for management of Atlantic Menhaden? And with that, I'll take questions. So op we're open to questions now, but if your questions have even a hint of a suggested change, I'd ask you to hold the thought because what we're going to do immediately following this question Q&A portion is go back through the document section by section and entertain any suggested changes. So right now, does anyone have any questions for Megan on her presentation with, with the understanding that we're going to go back over this document thoroughly um, in a moment? See, seeing no hands, uh, we will move to the um, AP uh, report on the uh, PID and I think Jeff Kalin is ready to offer that. Jeff? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and um, good afternoon, members of the Menhaden Board. I'm Jeff Kalin. I work with Lunds Fisheries in Cape May, New Jersey. Um, we are in the Persane uh, fishery for bait in New Jersey. Um, Megan has done an excellent job of uh, providing you with a written overview of the, Menhaden, of the uh, AP call that we had um, in October, and uh, actually, I guess it was in September. But she's also provided some slides, which I'm going to go through quickly, as quickly as possible, um, because some of the uh, uh, issues that were raised by the AP uh, have already been addressed um, in the document. So I'll, I'll try to blow through this quickly. Um, uh, we did have uh, 14 AP members on the calls. We had a very robust discussion of a whole variety of issues that I think are captured um, in our report. Um, there was no discussion about preferred management alternatives at this time, and I believe that there will be another AP call prior to your February meeting uh, when the AP will have an opportunity to review the PID hearing results and provide another uh, update to you. Um, so uh, on the next slide, I guess you've got control of the slides. Yeah, there you go. Uh, the stock status information, the uh, human use of Menhaden, um, the balance of the discussion uh, has already been addressed um, by, uh, by Megan. Um, I think the scale of the fishery issue probably will be addressed uh, with the socioeconomic report 
which also be, will be before you in, uh, in February, and probably with an opportunity for the uh, AP to comment on that at the, uh, prior to your February meeting. Uh, the standards uh, by which ASC manages the species are going to be included. The next slide is on reference points. And uh, as Megan suggest, uh, mentioned, uh, there were uh, at least two AP members who brought forward this additional option for consideration as one of the alternatives um, as an interim reference point. I believe it was Mr. Hinman and Mr. Paquette who advocated for this uh, additional option. And uh, the uh, AP uh, felt that it was appropriate to ask the PDT to, to evaluate its inclusion uh, in the document. Um, the reference for that uh, uh, option is included Smith uh, et al. So uh, there was um, some discussion about a manuscript in process by Hillborn et al, uh, an alternative to Pickett that focuses more on uh, the environmental linkages to recruitment for Atlantic menhaden and other forge fish. Uh, hopefully that will be published before this process ends. On the quota allocation slide, uh, both of these uh, have been addressed uh, in the PID. There was some language changes relative to the language concerning equitable balance between gear types and regions, which Megan commented on earlier. And the seasonal quota option um, is in the document. There was some discussion about the winter quota's value in allowing sampling of the adult population, perhaps. Uh, and then on allocation time frame, um, there was a pretty good discussion about perhaps using a longer time series uh, for the reallocation or the weighted reallocation down the road. And there were two periods that were suggested, 2006 to 2012 and 85 to 2012 that, uh, for analysis. So hopefully the board would include, could agree to have the technical people look at those options. Um, on quota transfers and overage payback, uh, I think both of the issues on this slide have been addressed um, by the staff and uh, are reflected in the document. We appreciate that, I think, as an AP generally. Next slide on episodic events. Um, similarly, uh, the first two bullets, I think, have been addressed by staff. And the third bullet was that perhaps uh, a specific increase in the uh, episodic event allowance of 2, 5, or 10 percent um, could be performed to determine whether uh, the small-scale fisheries needs could be addressed in that way. There's a similar uh, option in the PID, I think, um, that, that looks at things in that, in that way. On the Chesapeake Bay reduction cap piece, um, what does this say? Uh, there's been an underperformance. Um, and uh, some history of landings has been requested, although this is difficult because of the confidential nature of the data. And as far as other comments goes, um, these are relatively uh, minor. Um, there were a couple AP members who thought a research program and priority portion should be part of the PID. I hope that the, uh, as the board, as the AP chair, I would hope that, that you might add that because I think we need to look down the road so that the public and everybody has a better idea of what's going on out there, the best idea possible. And then um, the second bullet has to do with an appendix uh, table, and I think the staff has addressed that as well. So those are my, that's my report, and thank you, Megan, very much for uh, your summary. It's been very good working with her, and um, our AP is being reconstituted. I think you have several AP members to to uh, consider later, so we appreciate that very much. That ends my report, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Jeff. Questions for Jeff on the AP report? Seeing that, I just want to say I, I know I speak for everyone on the board in thanking the AP for their uh, engagement and, uh, and very helpful uh, uh, contributions to the process, which I know we're going to be continuing as we move through the Amendment 3 process, and, and thank you for your leadership, uh, Jeff. So. Um, we are now about to open the floor to suggested changes to the document. Uh, to save time, 
If members have suggestions for clarifying language changes that are not substantive in nature, um, you do not need to get those on the record this afternoon. You can simply convey those to Megan, provided you do so by the close of business on Friday. That's her deadline. She really needs to get this document finalized. So if you just have, you know, editorial suggestions, non-substantive in nature, um, please get those to Megan. You don't need to get those on the record today, um, but you do need to get those to her by Friday. I'll just note that I have already availed myself of that option by pro providing Megan with some suggested edits last week. With regard to substantive changes, which we are now about to consider, uh, Amy has been kind enough to offer to itemize the suggestions as they are made by putting them up on the board. Uh, we'll seek to develop the list by consensus, so if anyone is uncomfortable with a suggestion or has a different angle, weigh in and we'll work through it. Once everyone on the board has had the opportunity to offer suggested changes, I'll take some public comment. Actually, I think I'll allow for two opportunities for public comment. I think it might be easier to do it this way, one on the issue of reference points and then another on the various issues associated with allocation. Then at the very end, I'll come back to the board for a motion and a vote. So that's how I plan to proceed. Um, first, so we'll go section by section. We'll open up uh, the floor to comments and suggested changes and then move right through the document uh, in the order that Megan had uh, presented. So first, with regard to the introductory sections of the document, does anyone have any comments or suggested changes pertaining to the document up through page five, that is up to issue one reference points, uh, which we're about to take up? Does anyone have anything that they'd like to offer on anything up to the very first issue? So that would be up, to, up through page five. Seeing no hands, uh, we'll move to issue one reference points. Um, Suggested changes on that. Lynn Fagley. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, I admit that I hesitate with um, Menhaden. I'm not sure what qualifies as a substantive. So, um, and I hope this does. Um, but if it doesn't, please stop me. I, in the uh, option that involves the 40% um, unfished biomass, um, there is language in there that states that uh, that references the Pacific Fishery Management Council and sardine, and then it, and it says in parents, although it's not set at 40% of the unfished, unfished biomass level in that fishery. So for the sake of the public, and if it were me reading this, um, what is that sardine fishery set at, and why are we choosing 40%? I, I just wonder if it wouldn't be helpful for the public to know um, the way it's worded to me may make that 40% seem arbitrary unless it's in that Smith et al. paper that's referenced, which it, it might be. So I, I'm just looking for a little help for the public in understanding um, where that particular number came from and how it might compare to the Pacific number and also, and maybe not necessary, but interesting, how it compares to um, the Menhaden stock status. Thank you. All right, I'll try and tackle that, Lynn. Um, so um, to the first question of what the Sardine Council is using, I don't know it off the top of my head, but I do know it's lower. Um, I can add that to the document if you feel that that would answer some questions that you think might be posed by the public. Um, so I'm happy to do that. Um, in terms of where the 40% came from, it came from the LenFest proposal. Um, so that's why that um, paragraph there is kind of talking about a combination of the LenFest proposal and the 75% rule of thumb. Thank you. Uh, yes, John. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just uh, kind of a follow-up on Lynn's point. I was just wondering if in the options themselves it might be possible just to put in there what F we're looking at under some of these other guidelines as compared to what our current single species uh, guidelines are. I know you discuss it in the big intro to it, but like a lot of people, I just started looking at the options and it would be hard for the public to tell by looking at the options what the F would be for going to, you know, the 75% rule of thumb. So just to have what the actual F would be in there, I think would be helpful. Duly noted, thank you. Additional comments? 
suggested changes on the reference point portion of the PID. As you're thinking, or perhaps uh, as we near a conclusion, I'll just note that a thought uh, that I had, and that is on page seven, there's a fairly hefty paragraph that summarizes the BURP Working Group's review of the LENFEST related ERPs proposed by Pickett et al. and the response to the BURP Working Group offered by the LENFEST Forage Fish Task Force. If the board is comfortable with that, I think, very decent attempt to summarize the back and forth on the issue, so be it. Um, but as food for thought, it occurred to me that the document could just say that the BURP Working Group issued a memo highlighting several concerns with the approach and then cite that memo uh, that's in the appendix. It is in now and it would remain in. And then say that the LENFEST Task Force subsequently responded to the TC memo and then cite that response in the appendix where it currently is and, and leave it at that. So in lieu of attempting to summarize the issues and the positions of the TC and the task force relative to them, just essentially let the memo speak for themselves. Again, just, just a thought. I don't feel particularly strongly about the issue one way or the other, but I just wanted to float the thought for what it's worth. It just sort of struck me that it was a you know, decent attempt to summarize an important issue. And if the board's comfortable with it as proposed, fine. I just wanted to let you know that that had been something that occurred to me. Uh, I'm not offering it as a su suggested change. I'm just offering it as a thought that I had when I read through the document. Other thoughts, either in response to that comment or on any other issues under reference points? If not, I'll go to the public now. Does anyone from the public wish to um, comment on any of the issues in the PID that relate to reference points. This is going well. Uh, we're back to the board and uh, we'll move on to issue two and that's quota allocation. Does anyone, and I, you know, we'll go through these one by one. Uh, I mean, well, quota allocation is issue two. So I'll just, I'm sorry, I, I got ahead of myself. Uh, does anyone have any suggested changes pertaining to that issue? Yes, uh, uh, Terry Stockwell. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. First a question and then a suggestion. Um, was, has there been any discussion about um, an RSA under, under, uh, with a working group un, under the quota allocation section? Um, as far as my knowledge on the working group's discussions, I didn't see one on that, um, and the PDT did not discuss one. Well, pending discussion of the board, I would be interested in consideration of an RSA uh, it, option. Um, the second issue is um, is under the fleet size composition, and um, and, and there um, uh, the fleet capacity quotas. I want to note in Maine that uh, uh, Maine has several small capacity uh, purse seiners, uh, so uh, they're, they're they're not large capacity. So mm -hmm. you have a list of smaller gears. Uh, you know, there there are at least two of them here today. So I would you know request that a small you know small capacity per standards be considered as an option as well. Duly noted. Uh, yes, uh, Dr. Duval. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just um, in the preamble to the the quota allocation issues, it's the last paragraph on the bottom of page nine where it's giving some examples of different types of allocation. Oh, just it notes the golden towelfish fishery being allocated by gear type. That's specific to the South Atlantic, and it might be good to just note that because it's an IFQ program in the Mid-Atlantic. Uh, and just if you could, I'm sorry, what page were you on there? It's just the bottom of page nine, that paragraph that talks about the examples. Oh, yeah. Just, just noting that for golden towelfish, that is specific to the South Atlantic, the Mid-Atlantic, and IFQ. Gotcha. Program. Thank you. Duly noted. Additional Yes, David Simpson. Yep, just clarification on what uh, Terry said. Uh, the notes I'm looking at, um, the small capacity gears to be considered as an option. You are speaking particularly of small capacity purse saners, right? We need that clarification. Uh, yeah, to that point, yes. On, on uh, the three fleet capacity allocation, the small capacity fleet, uh, not limited to cast net, trawl, trap, pot, haul, same fike net, hook and line. Uh, there, are, there are small capacity, you know, 35, 40 foot per seiners as well. Okay, yeah, that, that's great. And the added uh, clarity of it's a 35 to 40 foot boat helps me a lot to understand it as a small capacity gear. Not necessarily limited to that. I, th I mean, 
Um, but 40 foot range, yeah, there. Dave, do you want to offer a thought yeah. on what you'd like to see in terms of maybe some clarification? Yeah, it, it would be helpful to me to um, un understand what what's meant by a small capacity per sane because it's sort of a, with my limited background in, in that fishery, it's a contradiction in terms. So, but I, but I understand in, in Maine those exist. So maybe you could put some sideboards on it, whether it was now or, or later, but a, a, a tonnage capacity or, or something of that nature, which I think would help the PID a lot. I mean, I'd feel more comfortable about talking uh, with our industry and getting getting back to to Megan with with an answer to that, and the board can review it at our upcoming meeting. I mean, there, there's likewise a medium capacity fleet. You know, we we do have some large saners, but they're not on the scale of the reduction vessels. Thank you. Uh, additional comments, thoughts? Yes, Rob O'Reilly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I provided Megan with what may be an additional quota allocation option, um, but of course we need to talk about it. If Megan can place that up there for everyone to look at, that'd be great. I think she's working on that That's as fine. we speak. Uh, so in the meantime, I'll just say that when you look through the allocation options, they are all mechanistic. Um, option F, disposition quotas, talks about the split between uh, bait and reduction a little bit. Um, option G, the fleet capacity quota, speaks to the idea that it can be used to um, allocate to different sectors, but there's not really an indication of what triggers these allocation changes. And so what I have, uh, I can't quite see that far, uh, yeah, okay, there we go. So what I have up there is the idea that um, there has to be some variable allocation issue included. In other words, it's based on the, based on the quote itself. And as you heard me earlier, um, I hope it's not just my thought, but the uh, 212, 500 metric tons really is looked at as the starting point. And the reason for that is that when allocation came about and was passed along with the 20% reduction, it was in a manner different than some other allocation schemes. Usually when you have an allocation situation, you have at least time for states to start limited entry proposals. And of course with Menhaden, some states do already, um, some states don't. And what that did was it, uh, it really induced the uh, short changing effect that was mentioned earlier. And in another sense, it also didn't really look at the capacity um, down the road. So in general, what this um, item will show is that there is a way that depending on the strength of the quota, the magnitude of the TAC, that the allocation to different sectors, uh, whether it be bait or reduction or regional or in whatever manner, um, should be influenced by that magnitude of the allocation. And I think the public at least needs to see an idea of, well, where is this quota possibly going to go? Where's the TAC possibly going to be distributed? Now, granted, um, there may not be consensus on the middle there. Uh, that you have to get back to where we were in 2012 before the 20% reduction to consider allocation. But I have to tell you, when we had those numerous calls led by Robert Boyles on allocation, I think there were seven, he might tell me eight, I don't know. But the first call was involved with everyone trying to figure out the difference between allocation and reallocation. And I think Bill Goldsboro, who was uh, on the call as part of the public said, Let's not play with semantics, it's reallocation. Um, but realistically, given the background of how this allocation came about, um, I think that probably we should build some uh, biomass here, which we have, and from that we should build our TAC, which we have incrementally, but not even to get back to where we have a 
slate that existed before all these reductions. So um, definitely take some comments on that. But I think there is some good information here about the public being able to see the various ways that the TAC can be distributed. And it's a little less vague than perhaps um, options F and G. Thank you. Let's leave that up on the board, uh, on the screen. Does anyone from the board have any comments or concerns regarding the recommendation to add a new uh, option H as indicated? Give you a minute to just make sure you've digested it. So uh, my understanding, Rob, is that this would go uh, be added to the uh, document as presented here. Um, so this would be the actual language that would be inserted. It would be a new option, and it would be, and that would be the clarifying language as indicated on the screen in terms of what the option seeks to do. Uh, that's correct, uh, Mr. Chairman. And also, Megan gave a little helping hand because the original um, quota allocation scenario. Uh, was confusing maybe to the public in that it mixed up TAC and quotas, and I think that's been straightened out. And so this would be what is proposed. And again, it is a little different in that it, it talks about the magnitude of the quota and actions that might happen after that. Thank you. Uh, I don't see any hands going up, so I think what I'm going to, we can come back to this, but for now I'm going to ask uh, Amy to you know, pull this back and then just add as the bullet um, a new option H um, with, the, with the title that it had, and I actually forget what it said, but um, that will be uh, a proposed addition. Other thoughts, comments, Lynn? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just going back to um, Terry's comment about the small capacity purses, um, there's a couple things that might be worth doing with that. And one of them is in the document, table three breaks down um, the landings by gear. And I think one of the points of that table is to illustrate to the public the magnitude of the specific gears, you know, how much of the harvest that they're proportionally catching. And the purses are um, at 94%. And so clearly, I would imagine that the main small capacity purses would be lumped into that um, purses category, which makes it very hard for. It's going to, I think it's going to be confusing. And so, one thing, there's two ways I think that maybe could make this easier and get the board better input. Um, in the description of the capacity, of the fleet capacity allocation option, it talks about the idea that you could define your small capacity uh, fleet through trip limits. So in other words, um, if, you're, if, you're a, if you're a small capacity fleet boat, you're not harvesting more than 20,000 pounds at a shot, and I'm making that number up. But one of the things maybe we could do is add into the public comment questions what would be a suitable small capacity trip limit in order to make sure that we are doing a good job defining that capacity. Because I worry when we start overlapping these gears, and you know, I, I'm not arguing with, with Terry's point. I, I just want to make sure, I think it's going to start to get confusing. And maybe one way to get at that that's just crystal clear is asking, what are we talking about here for a trip limit? So I, that sounds like a good suggestion to me. Terry, does that work for you? I'm not sure yet. Um, I mean, I just don't want to, I mean, I, I don't want to lose sight of the fact that we have an effort that I don't feel is fully, fully um, recognized in the draft document at this point. Okay. Working through these issues, any, any other thoughts or comments either on what's already been discussed or anything new under this issue? I'll just note that under the public comment questions, it struck me that we might have been jumping the gun a little bit in the way they were teed up. If you, if you move to those comments, I'm wondering if the board has any opposition to adding uh, uh, two, two additional questions, one at the very beginning, which would be 
Should the board maintain or revise the allocation formula currently used to manage the commercial Atlantic Menhaden fishery? It seems to me that's the first sort of open-ended question, but it's sort of what, it, it tees up well what follows. And then as the last question, are there other options besides those offered in this document that the board should consider? Again, just really trying to make sure we've rounded out this very important issue. Um, so if there's no objections, I'd like to uh, suggest adding those two questions uh, under the public comment questions portion of uh, issue two. Is there anything else on issue two? Dave. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chair. I think following up on Lynn's suggestion, I, th I thought that was a good one, actually, just asking questions. When we say small, small scale, what do we mean? What is the public's perception of what is small, <coughs> what's medium, what's large? Um, so, so we get that on the table and understand. I, I'm, uh, yeah, I think it's good to consider another type of gear that we haven't thought about, but I, I'd need to, I'd need to know myself. Is that a, is that a small scale gear that's capable of taking a hundred thousand pounds or ten thousand pounds? That uh, does it meet my definition of small scale and my perception? So I, I think they'd be really helpful comments to add, or questions to add rather. Thank you. Didn't realize I had my mic on, sorry. Um, anything else? If not, let's move on to issue three, allocation time frame. Comments, recommended changes to that. Yes, Jim Gilmore. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, as I was looking through these, um, you know, in some respects it's hard to figure out if they're going to fix the problem or not. Uh, and as I went through B and C, it kind of reminded me, for all you folks around, we're doing spiny dogfish. We took different time series and we got into this little bit of a quandary because some folks liked the early 80s, some folks liked the late 70s because it all came down to what was giving them a better deal. Um, the suggestion I have, and I'm not sure if there's problems with it, is to add to option D is why we couldn't use the last, the most recent five years. I mean, we're looking backwards and I think where we want to go is to use most recent data. So why we couldn't put in an option that we would use the landings from 2013 through 2017, which actually I think part of the problem, at least for New York, was we weren't um, recording landings. We fixed that probably in 2011, 2012, and I think the other states probably ramped up too. So that may give us a more accurate picture of what the actual distribution is. Jim, just a quick comment on that. Um, so we won't have 2017 landings finalized by the time we take final action on this. So um, my guess would be the board would want to know what each state's allocation would be depending on which time series or method we use. So we wouldn't be able to do that analysis for that option. Maybe 2012 to 2016, would that be okay? Okay. Yeah, that would be fine. Whatever f the most recent previous five years we would look at, which is the most recent data. And just to state the obvious, those landings were con have been constrained by the state quotas. So, um, I mean, it is what it is, but I think uh, as long as that's clearly stated in, in characterizing that option, I think it makes sense to me to offer it. Jim? Yeah, I understand that, Bob, but remember with, you know, with the transfers we had, you could probably get, even though you're constrained by those quotas, there still was a better picture of how much transferring was going on, which I think will, well, it may, it's just another option to give us maybe a better way to get out of the box and so we don't get back to spiny dogfish again. No, I, think it's, I think it's a good suggestion. I just think it, as long as that clarifying or explanatory language is added to help the public understand uh, the context, that, that, that seems fine. Uh, Roy? Just to add to that, by using that uh, recent period, it would also factor in the bycatch landings, which uh, really should be considered in any uh, quota reallocation. Thank you. Good point. I like that idea. Uh, yes, Emerson. Yeah, to add to what Jim and Roy had said, I would I would say add in the, the bycatch um, numbers as well as the episodic event uh, landings as well. Yes, all duly noted. Thank you. And I hope, I actually don't see what's going on up on the screen, but I'm hoping that we're, I know Megan is writing everything down and I know Amy is doing her best to capture the thoughts. So, uh, but it all makes sense to me so far. Adam? Just as a general comment, I think that there's some great minds getting information out and certainly the public consumption element of it is important. But we're starting to add an awful lot that almost looks like the draft itself. 
and I think one of the important things we want to make sure we do is leave open general comments as we put in all these specific issues, options, sometimes it gets the public to key in, latch on to one of those options and it doesn't generate the free thought that sometimes we can get out of these. I don't know how we encompass that. Uh, again, I certainly don't want to dismiss the thoughtfulness that's going around, but I hear and see all these options that are being generated and it's almost starting to look like the amendment itself to me and I just wanted to put that forward. Sure, we could do a PID that just asks, what do you think we should do with Menaden? And <laughs> but no, I, get, I take your point. It, it, I think it's a point well taken, Adam. I didn't mean to be too facetious, but it, we want to, and I think the open-ended questions are in here, but I take your point that they f they're followed by a bunch of specific options, and, it, and, it, um, and we need to be careful about making sure we've got the right balance between open-ended questions that we really want to solicit good thinking and, and good brainstorming on versus here's, here's the, op the limited number of options that you have to consider. We don't want to do that. We want to make sure the public uh, gives us all their thoughts on, on the full range of issues that uh, they would like us to consider. So I think it's a point well taken. And if anyone has any specific suggestions for, uh, or Adam, I'm not sure if you, that was just sort of a general comment or whether you had a specific re request to change something. I mean, I think your point's well taken. I'll just leave it at that. Jim? Yeah, just a quick clarification for Amy. It's actually adding option D to that to that issue. Thank you, uh, Lynn. Uh, thank you. I, so I, I still sometimes wake up in a cold sweat remembering the allocation conversation that we had in 2012 when we talked about the various reference periods that we could use, and in that conversation in 2012. The reference period that we ultimately chose was justified in part by the quality of the data. And there was a lot of conversation about the fact that the data quality from earlier time periods just wasn't there. Um, so I just wonder if the document, if there should, if the document should speak to that a little bit so the, the public isn't working under the assumption that all of those years are created equal in terms of the data quality. I mean, clearly that was, you know, an issue for New York. But, you know, it just, it concerns me a little bit. I just don't want to lose sight of that because we did use it as justification for a reference period. Thanks. Good, good point. Well taken. I, I, I'd like to revisit just a quick Q&A I had with Megan um, just on the record. I'll make sure she's listening to me. I had asked her um, at the end of the first paragraph under issue three, there's a sentence that reads, regardless of the allocation scheme chosen in issue two, historic landings will be used to allocate the TAC. And I think my point blank question to her was, what do, exactly does that mean? And I'd like to give her a chance on the record to answer uh, in terms of her interpretation and then make sure the board's comfortable with that language. Uh, Megan? Yeah, so the question was added following the advisory panel call um, during our call with the PDT. On the AP call, there were some questions. Um, going back to the allocation method, um, there was a sentence that said, there's concern that this is not a fair and equitable um, allocation method that we're currently using. And there was some consternation over that sentence, especially the fair and equitable part, um, noting that we're using historic landings to allocate and how could that not be fair and equitable. And so we tried to reword that, um, but I think also try and um, address some confusion on what else would we use besides historic landings. And so at that point, we're just trying to clarify that we are still using historic landings to set the TAC, um, regardless of the method chosen. Um, it's just what method and what years we use. And I guess I'll just say that, you know, I'm trying to think that through and make sure it's reconciled with the ERP section of this. Um, so if the board's comfortable, fine. If not, I was just struck by the potential awkwardness of that sentence. Uh, Richie. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, I guess I have a problem with that wording. I guess I'd rather have and maybe use something like in part. Historic landings will be used in part, so it doesn't tie us to in this process, if we figure, figure out uh, some new method we decide on, that we shouldn't be locked in with that. So I, Richie has offered a suggestion that, it, that we amend that sentence to read in part. Um, so we'll add that up as a, as a suggested change. Dave, did you? 
Wh where is this exactly so I can catch up with it? So um, I'm, I don't know if I have the right page. On, for me, I have page 15. It's issue three. Sorry, do I have that right? Page 13. It's page 13. Issue three, allocation time frame background. There's a paragraph there. And the last sentence in that paragraph reads, regardless of the allocation scheme chosen. Do you see that now? Dave? Yeah, so uh, there are alternatives that would not require any historical um, um, basis. In other words, I, I think in particular the, the size of the fisheries, small-scale fisheries, medium-scale fisheries, large-scale fisheries, would not necessarily have to be history-based. I mean, you, you could argue that small-scale fisheries, uh, there's a cap of 2 percent. That's, that's what we're picking. Um, and that's what will be allocated and it will be shared among all the states that have small-scale fisheries. And so it won't, it, you know, it will get us out from under the concern that this or that state with their small-scale fisheries didn't, didn't have proper accounting of landing. So I, 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 would, I would like to remove that sentence because I think there are clear alternatives that don't require any look into history. I think we can, um, I think we can do it without, without that. So we have a couple of suggestions. One would be to remove that sentence entirely. The other would be to amend it to uh, insert in part. David Borden? Yeah, I, I'd just like to go on record as supporting the comment that, that both David and Richie made. Maybe uh, more accurate if we said something like historic landings may be used depending upon the, the uh, alternatives selected. That sounds fine, too. I, I, I find myself starting to wonder, what, what are we really trying to say, if, if anything, that isn't already evident in the document? Um, I mean, is there a really need to say anything? That, I'm, I'm leaning toward the sentence doesn't really need to be there. Um, that's, that's my sense. Is there anyone, is there any strong objection to just removing that sentence with the understanding that the, the options speak for themselves in terms of whether they rely upon historic landings or not? It, it doesn't seem like there's any objection. So we'll remove that sentence. Thank you. Uh, other thoughts or any other suggested changes on issue three? Let me make sure I covered my own comments here. Yeah, that was the only one I had. So um, we're on to issue four, quota transfers and overage payback. Anything on that? Richie. Yeah, I don't have the document in front of me because it, I don't have uh, web coverage. Um, the, the rollover uh, provision. I'd like to see something in there that a state uh, would have the option to uh, not have their unused quota rolled over. So in other words, if a state wanted to be more conservative, and I'd give the example of striped bass, New Hampshire has a small commercial striped bass quota and New Hampshire chooses not to use it. We could allocate that to recreational fishing if we so desired, but we choose to not harvest it as a conservation measure, and I think the there ought to be that opportunity for the public to weigh in on, on that uh, in this instance. Richie, maybe we could formulate that into a question um, as a public, so if it was something, um, should states be required to um, transfer unused quota to a common pool or could that be voluntary? Something along that, would that be okay? Okay. Great, thanks. Other suggestions on this issue? Seeing none, we move to um, the next issue, which is uh, quota, quota rollovers. Any thoughts on any changes to the document on the issue of quota rollovers? Seeing none, and if anyone has, you know, thinks of something as we get closer to the end here and they want to go back, that would be fine. But we'll just continue on to issue six, uh, incidental catch and small scale fishery allowance. Um, I'll just note right up front that I think it's, it might be misleading to say that the intent of the bycatch allowance is to account for incidental catch, that's the wording currently used, since that implies that bycatch is accounted for as part of the TAC. Since that's not the case, I think it might be more accurate to say that the intent of the allowance is to accommodate and track incidental catch. Just a, really just a sort of subtlety there, but I think it's more accurate to say that we account and track uh, incidental catch via the bycatch. We don't account uh, because it just, again, suggests that it's accounted for as part of the tax. So that was one thought I had. Um, 
and then I just wondered whether option A should be characterized as status quo since it reflects the current state of affairs under Addendum 1. And Megan and I have gone back and forth on this. I know, you know, you can either look at Addendum 1 as the, you know, current um, as status quo because it's been adopted and is now duly uh, and is indeed a part of our program under Amendment 2. On the other hand, you know, is it more of an interim measure until we tackle it again under Amendment 3? Again, a subtlety there, but I just was wondering if the board had any thoughts on whether we want to, we sort of do that throughout the document uh, where we offer options. Option A tends to be status quo, so I just found myself wondering whether we should do that here. So those were just the two thoughts I had. Additional thoughts from the uh, board? Yes, John? Thank you, Mr. Chair. For, I, I agree with you. I'd like to see status quo in there so states where this is an important part of the fishery would understand that's what it is. I just found in the whole uh, description here, it's a little confusing. I, I understand wanting to go to incidental catch from bycatch, but the two terms are used throughout the uh, description, and it does get a little confusing. I mean, I think if we're going to change it to incidental catch, explain that in the first paragraph, define it, and then use it consistently because, as I said, it goes back and forth, and even when we get to the statement of the problem, it says incidental bycatch limit, and then when you go to the options, it's incidental catch. So uh, it's a little... You know, consistency here would really help the public, I think. I, I, very good point, I think. Thank you. Uh, yes, Lynn. Yeah, and I, I, I'm still struggling with this one a little bit. With, with Amendment 2, when this came up, you know, really the crux of the issue here was there's a, there's a difference to, there, there's a difference between a fishing gear, you know, that's completely passive that only encounters what swims through it as compared to something that you can actually go out and seek out Menhaden to set on. And, and so the problem with the stationary gears really initially when we were going through Amendment 2 was that, you know, call it targeted or call it bycatch or call it incidental, call it what you will, these gears, um, they don't move and the, the end result of of shutting them down for a Menhaden quota might be shutting down the other fisheries that those fish harvest or really ugly uh, discards of dead Menhaden. And, and so I guess I, guess I just, um, I think, I, I, I'm throwing it out to the board for conversation. I, I think maybe, I don't know if it would be helpful for, to have a clear explanation of sort of the, the issue here with by, why bycatch was identified as what it is, and I'm not sure I'm making sense, and I might just have to think about it, and maybe Megan sends you some stuff, but I'm, I'm just, I don't want, I feel like we're confusing bycatch, and we're confusing the gear issue. There's two separate, sort of two separate conflating issues going on here, so, for what it's worth. Thank you. Rob? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So it seems that we all participated in characterizing our bycatch, and ASMSC staff has that. So maybe next time that we meet or whenever, um, we can go over that and sort of delineate um, exactly what Lynn is talking about in terms of the passive gears versus others. But Rob, just speak a little closer to your mic. Thank oh, you. Very sorry. I was talking to you, but I'm being the microphone. I'm sorry. Um, so the ASMSC staff has the characterization of the bycatch um, by gear type. And so that's something we can look at, and there could be a determination that certain gears might be under a cap, which is one of the um, options here, option D, incidental catch and trigger, and other gears may not. But since we just left an issue where we're thinking that if we try and change the time frame from 2009-11 to anything else, that we would include the uh, bycatch, you know, the 6,000 pound allowance in that, we'll have to sort all that out. So I just want to, under, I, think, I think I followed you. Are you just commenting on, on the, the challenge of addressing this issue, or, or do you have any suggested changes for the document? Uh, the change, I think, would be under D, there's a cap, but there are gears that are stationary, and it may be that those gears are treated differently um, than those that aren't stationary. And I don't know how you would word that uh, 
because it's really a combination of D and C. Well, I know Megan is scribbling down everything you're saying, and it, I think she's going to take, give it her best shot to try to uh, take your suggestion. And Megan, do you, she's nodding yes, so I think I think she's going to put her brain to work on that one. Is that good with you for now? I think that's fine. I, I think what the intent here is that we know there's been growth in unexpected fisheries, and we know that in a lot of areas there aren't limited entries, so that growth is going to be there. But how do we address that? And one way we already talked about is to include the bycatch as part of the total jurisdiction or state um, landings. The second idea is that perhaps there's a cap for those gears that are not stationary and that the stationary gears really have a situation where they are status quo to the Amendment 2 where you have that 6,000 or 12,000 pounds with two licensees. So I think we can work that out later, but that's the gist of it. Thank you. Tom? Are we overcomplicating this? I mean, we're getting into the nuts and bolts altogether. I thought this is a draft amendment to go out to, for public information. And we're sitting there trying to go through all the nuts and bolts that we're basically can think of. We should, we're going out to find out what the public thinks we should add to this document, and then we'll sit around and do this. We can sit here and, and micromanage what we're going to send out to a public information document, but we're really looking for the comments from the public. As long as we give them a general idea of what we're doing, but we shouldn't be this specific. Thank you, and that, that's certainly consistent with Adam's comment. And it is a tough balance here. You know, you want to provide open-ended questions, but you want to give the public something to go on in terms of thinking through the uh, the various options. So I, it's 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 a it's a balance, and I appreciate the comments on both sides of the table. Yeah, Tom, a follow? Yeah, I mean, but. Is the public going to read that 87-page document looks like we're putting together here? What we need to be is, as, it's like when Kirby sent out the stuff on Summer Flounder. It was concise. It was easy to read. I even understood all of it. So it was not, not like badly written. But when we get too complicated, too many pages, we're going to basically scare the people from actually opening their mouths. So I'd like to get a shorter document so the public can really read it and get the answers to what they want. Thank you. Uh, John? Uh, sorry to complicate things further, but I was just wondering under what Rob was just talking about if that could be changed to active and passive gears because I know a lot of our bycatch comes from drift gill nets, which are not stationary. Any objection, Rob, to uh, active and passive? I'll come back to your simplification under the quotas, and there may just be a question. Um, do stationary fixed gears uh, need to have their incidental catch counted against the um, state's landings or state's quota. Thank you. Maybe that's just a question then, and, and that'd be the easiest thing for people to respond to. I like that thought. Uh, Roy? Mr. Chairman, I, I need your opinion on this. Um, it seems to me that we have to keep the, our goals in mind here, and a problem in our particular state has been that um, more than 100% of our landings um, have been bycatch. In other words, our, by our total landings are, have been averaging around 150,000 pounds, yet our quota allocation is, let's say, 50,000 pounds, just to round the numbers off. We've got to avoid that. It is, is what we've outlined in Issue 6 a way to get out of that conundrum, in your view? Well, um, I appreciate the question. I, I think you hit the nail on the head in terms of we are trying to um, address what has been a very confusing um, issue in our management program, and that is how we're handling bycatch. So I think absolutely positively issue six is intended to get at this issue. Um, and again, this is really, uh, I'm not sure I'm prepared to offer a yes or no answer. In well, it, it is our goal. It is our goal, Roy. Yes, that is the goal of this issue, is to ensure that we have given the public an opportunity to comment on how we can better address the issue that you just spoke to in terms of what's, um, you know, a very important one for Delaware and, frankly, up and down the coast. So um, I, I look to the board for thoughts on whether this is perfectly 
presented or whether we can do anything to better present it, um, but your, the goal is indeed to try to fix the bycatch issue, um, and I'll just leave it at that for now. Dave? I was going to say, Roy, this is the section I am hoping resolves a lot of this and, and, and a lot of the issues of state-by-state state allocation, and that's option F in particular is what I was looking to to get us out from under that. So there's a coastwide set aside for a, for a, a subset of gears that we define in this amendment, and whatever they catch under some determined trip limit, 6,000 pounds, whatever it is, that that counts toward this overall set aside it's accounted for, but you're not having two-thirds of your catch outside of your quota. It's just clearly as part of this coastwide set aside, um, and and you don't have to. The states are relieved from having to monitor a Menhaden quota. Thank you. I think that helped a lot. Other thoughts on this issue? I think we've got two more. Uh, the next being episodic events set aside program. Thoughts on that issue as currently presented in the PID? Any suggested changes? I think there is a fairly good range of options offered. Um, in terms, well, actually, there, there are a fairly good number of questions offered in terms of how best how it could be better configured. Has the issue been adequately addressed? Seeing no hands, I'm going to assume the answer is yes, and we'll move on to the last issue, and that is uh, the Chesapeake Bay reduction fishery cap. Any requests or comments regarding that? Seeing none, why don't we pause the board discussion and see if anyone from the public has any uh, comments that they'd like to offer to the board on any of the issues uh, as set forth in the PID. Yes, in the back. Thank you. Uh, hi, Jenny Beekress from Maine, and I'm also an AP um, on the AP. Um, I guess I, w I just want to make sure um, before we leave this meeting today that, that there are going to be other options uh, back in the uh, allocation um, because you have not been that specific, and I understand this is just the draft, but I also don't want to leave here today not knowing that there is going to be an option that includes historical landings um, because we are one of those states who we don't have a, a, a fishery all the time, but we had huge landings um, back in the 80s. I think it was, uh, oh, I don't have it with me. They were, they were very significant. And um, I just want to make sure that those years that there is going to be an option in the um, the document that that includes those you know you've mentioned it in here but I just I don't want to leave here today not knowing that 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 the board is at least in agreement that that should definitely be an option provided to the public because uh, we really got hurt in this and if you don't include some of those years this year you know if you if you include the most recent years which i heard somebody suggest yeah those are very still inhibited by the 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 quota reduction and the allocations the way it came out we could we could have had a lot of fish this year but we thank god had the the um episodic event that we could work on but we could have caught a heck of a lot more fish you know if we'd had a quota to begin with so to go with the most recent catch numbers is a joke too we're still not going to get any quota so i would please encourage you to make sure you've included some that includes some historical landings thank you thank you jenny and i, I would represent that under issue two option b there is uh it, it's called longer time series average and it, it, it is an open-ended option that would allow for uh comments on what a longer time series might be. And so I, my take is that the document does indeed invite uh, that sort of comment and uh, input on that issue. So thank you for that. And I, I feel comfortable that the document covers it, but that's just my own opinion. If any board member has a different opinion, uh, I'll let them speak to it. Terry. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I share your level of comfort and want to point out to Jenny that option C, the weighted allocation, also uh, offers two different time periods, one more distant, one more recent. So I think we have the options in here to look at uh, alternatives other than the status quo. Thank you. Other comments from the public? Seeing none, we'll come back to the board. Um, so at this point, well, let me just ask, is there, are there any other comments from the board on any other issues or aspects, uh, issues in the PID or aspects? Uh, yes, Wilson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would just uh, ask that we do take the AP recommendation that we add a section on research programs and priorities. And I think those, Megan, are already um, available, or did we already do that? If we haven't done it, you know, the AP suggested it, and I certainly would support that. And I think we already have those, Megan. You know, we do the compilation every two years, I think, of all the uh, research needs, and then we prioritize those for each species. So I think that's just a matter of, of uh, cut and paste from what we already have on that particular topic. So Wilson, um, I haven't looked back at those research recommendations for Menhaden, but what I'm hearing just conferring at the table is those might be a bit old for Menhaden, but we do have the 2015 stock assessment that had research recommenda recommendations. So if you're comfortable with that, we'll put those in. Yes, ma'am, I, I am fine with that. And perhaps we might just run those by the TC real quickly just to see if they have any suggested updates to those. I can try and do that, Wilson. Um, just so the board knows, we're on a pretty tight turnaround time to get this out. Um, the PID does have to be out for 30 days before we can hold a public hearing and 14 days after. Um, and with the holidays, that really does um, put some crunch on this document. So um, the goal is to get it out either Monday or Tuesday of next week. So I will send an email to the TC and see if there are any comments, Wilson. And again, this is a PID. This is not the draft amendment. So it's not so, I don't think it's so vital that we capture all the research recommendations. That would be a draft amendment issue. For the PID, it's really do we, should the amendment include uh, uh, research recommendations and perhaps reference those that have already been offered through the uh, stock assessment and leave it at that. I, I don't think we necessarily need to have an updated list before the PID goes out because we're really just scoping the issues, not trying to resolve them as has been uh, noted here today. Uh, yes, Nicole? I'm sorry, Nicola? Uh, perhaps that section could also address Terry's suggestion with a question about should part of the quota be set aside for research? Yeah, that's a nice, I like that combo approach. Thank you. Good suggestion. Anything else? If not, what I, I know Amy, I actually I haven't been looking over my shoulder, but I have a full faith and confidence that Amy has been doing a yeoman's job capturing the comments as they've been offered. Um, so what I'm going to ask for is a motion uh, that would uh, be a motion to approve the public information document for Amendment 3 to the FMP for Atlantic Menhaden, inclu including the changes agreed to by the board at its October 2016 meeting, or we could say with the following changes and list everything that's up on the board. It's really your preference in terms of how you want to handle it. I know when we did Amendment 2, I went back and we, the amendment, I'm sorry, the motion included all of the changes. So whether we just reference the changes and use the record of this meeting to be the, or whether the motion include all the changes, that's your call. Robert? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm going to take up my colleague, uh, Dr. Rhodes, and suggest that brevity is the, uh, or what is it, brevity is the soul of wit or something? I would move to approve the Atlantic Manhattan PID with the addition suggested and discussed by the board here today and, and approve it for public hearings. Is there a second to that? Se uh, seconded by Jim Gilmore. So moved by Robert Boyle, seconded by Jim Gilmore to uh, approve the public information document for Amendment 3 to the FMP for Atlantic Menhaden, including the changes agreed to by the board uh, at its October 2016 meeting. Is, is, uh, comments on the motion. Uh, Cherie? Yes, I would just like to recommend that we add to that that uh, not just these uh, suggested changes, but also editorial changes that you have allowed to uh, continue until Friday. Would you like the motion amended to reflect that? 
Yes, I would. Is Robert, are you comfortable amending the motion to include editorial changes submitted to uh, the FMP coordinator by the close of business Friday? That's a wordy motion, but I think that's what I just heard recommended. Actually, I'd be more comfortable with the substitute, but no, no that's yeah. fine. Yes, I'm comfortable. Jim, as the seconder, are you comfortable? Okay, so let's amend that motion accordingly. And I like that because it puts a date certain on, on when the changes need to be into Megan. Anything after Friday close of business, um, too late. Other uh, comments on the motion? Is the board ready to vote on the motion? If so, is there any objection to the motion? Seeing none, the motion passes unanimously by consent. Thank you very much. I thought that was an awesome job uh, working through uh, the document and uh, away we go with the Amendment 3 process. Uh, so we're on to item seven, the technical committee report on the paper titled The Fate of Atlantic of an Atlantic Menhaden Year Class. And for that, I will go to our TC chair, Jason McNamee. Hello, um, so I have a, a brief presentation here. I'll try to go real quick. Um, this, we had a, a Menhaden Technical Committee conference call, um, and that's what this uh, is in reference to. We uh, reviewed the updated analysis for the paper, The Fate of an Atlantic Menhaden Year Class by Peter Himchek. So we had originally reviewed um, this uh, analysis that Mr. Hemchek did uh, back in June. We gave him some feedback. We also offered that feedback to the board. Uh, and then in August, uh, you all requested that we um, catch back up with Pete. Uh, he had worked on the feedback, incorporated, I think, a lot of it. And um, so we re-reviewed it. Uh, so the technical committee commended Mr. Hemchek's efforts to analyze impacts of fishing mortality on the Menhaden stock. Uh, we also appreciated the fact that in, in this, one of the things we had offered him was it was important to include um, natural mortality in the updated analysis, which, uh, which he did. And so uh, we, we're just gonna offer a, a couple of additional thoughts. Um, it's important to understand that this analysis provides one perspective on how a hypothetical year class erodes over time, uh, but it would be helpful to provide a parallel calculation which focuses on the mature portion of the population. And just to get into a little more detail on that, uh, Menhaden reached 50% maturity at age two and so the roughly 13 billion fish which are removed uh, from the population due to natural mortality before they mature never really contribute to the recruitment of the stock. They're not involved in that part of the population dynamics. And so we felt it was more appropriate to understand the harvest as a percent of the mature population and not the entire population, including um, the juveniles, the young of the year. Um, in those earliest years. <clears throat> uh, additionally, given selectivity, a focus on the ages two and older, um, this would address the, our previous recommendation of evaluating the impact on the harvestable portion of the population. So that was a, a piece of uh, feedback that we had given Pete before as well. Um, and so the analysis highlights the large impact that natural mortality has on the juvenile portion of the Menhaden stock. Um, you can see that in the analysis that Mr. Hemchek did. Um, but it's important to put that in context. And so while the estimate of AMAT age from the 2015 benchmark assessment is the best available science, that's why we used it, uh, there's still a lot of uncertainty in this calculation. In fact, it's time uh, invariant in the way that we used it and, and we know that's not the case. Um, and so as a result, the calculation of M in the analysis is only as good as the estimates from the assessment. Um, so these calculations of M, you know, thinking kind of down the road a little bit, these could be improved uh, and hopefully we'll have some better information on natural mortality uh, based on the work being conducted by the biological and ecological reference point uh, working group. Um, just a, a final slide here, and, and as I kind of reread this, it sounds kind of finger waggy, and that's actually not uh, how we meant it. It was actually more of a 
constructive um, comment from the TC, so I'm not going to read any of these, but I'll offer you what we actually meant. Um, and so what, you know, we received this analysis kind of, uh, you know, without much context. And so what we were struggling with was how to approach our comments. We certainly offered feedback back to Mr. Himchek. That was obvious enough. But if there had been some larger context that the board was thinking about this analysis, they wanted to, um, I don't know, just to offer an example, use it as a, a model external type of analysis that you wanted to look at. That could have focused our comments a little better. And we could have, uh, in the end, what we want to provide you is what you want to know from you know, our review. And so that, that's what those, those um, bullets mean there. Um, and so with that, I'm happy to take any questions that anyone has. Why don't we, I know Mr. Hemchek is here, and I'd like to invite him up to the microphone to just offer some brief comments. Um, Pete. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I uh, thank the Commission and the Technical Committee for affording me the opportunity to get grilled during two webinars by the Technical Committee. It's not something I'd like to do on a regular basis. But uh, this product came out in February. I did it for the Menhaden Fisheries Coalition. And basically, I mean, I sat at this board for seven or eight years, and, and the numbers are mind-boggling. The numbers of fish in the population at each age, the harvest at each age, it's all in the assessment document. So what I was trying to do is, is put some context in, you know, 1% or a metric ton. How many fish is that? And what does that represent in the overall scheme of the population? So I took the assessment document. You can follow any year class. And you, I recommend you do this. You take the CDAR 40 document. You follow a year class from 0 to 6 plus, And you, you look up the reduction landings from 0 to 6 plus, And you'll come up with some an analysis like this. You'll, you'll see, well, we started out with 15.4 billion zeros that were recruited to the fishery. And we ended up with 171 million six-year-old fish. Well, what happened to all the other fish? There were just under a, mil a billion, just under a billion were harvested from primarily two, threes, and fours, and fives. So where did all the other fish go? And, and, and I agree with the technical committee on, you know, you, you want to look at fishing pressure Certainly, the two to four year old fish, that's what we have to calculate it. That's, that's most, most appropriate. But my message was, was more, it was more to, to define what the ecosystem is taking out of a year class. And if you look, in, and, and again, I, I, I welcome you to just take the assessment document. It's not, it's not complicated math by any means. And track a year class, and you'll find that, you know, you go, you lose 10 billion or so in going from zeros to ones. Well, where do they go? Natural mortality. And yes, the data are only as good as what's in the assessment document. But I mean, that's, that's what exists. And, and, and so um, in essence, I, I agree with the technical committee on their first bullet. Uh, my responses are in a six page document that are in the uh, supplemental materials. I welcome you to read that. Um, yeah, the TC was, was reining me in on, on, you know, exploitation rates, you know, don't, I didn't want to go there. But, um, so basically we came to an understanding, I think, and, uh, you know, my message was a little more, uh, based on the year class and not on the fishery. Uh, as far as assessing fishing impact, all I did was measure what, what occurred over a 10 year period from 2004 to 2013. That's, that's all I did. So I'll take any questions. Thank you. Any questions for either Jason or Peter? Seeing none, is there any further tasking that the board would like the TC to undertake on this issue? Uh, Emerson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, not directly related to this issue, but someone, somewhat tangential to it. 
and and I don't know if the request is better directed to the uh, the technical committee um, or to the committee looking at the biological ecological reference points that working group so I'll, I'll raise it now and um, um, you can direct it wherever you feel it most appropriate um, if you feel it's appropriate something I've been thinking about relative to an ecological approach um, to to Menhaden is um, how do we explore the impact that Menhaden has on other species we know that Menhaden are filter feeders and they graze on plankton so but some percentage of that diet is ichthyoplankton and you know they're being distributed further and further along the coast now so so what I keep thinking about, and I've, and I've tried to look into this and haven't gotten very far, is what's the impact on other species? Things like striped bass, weak fish, maybe tautog, other species as well. So what's the impact of the grazing on ichthyoplankton of, um, on other species of the larger and larger biomass of menhaden? How do we get at that, and, and how is it relative to this ecological approach discussion? Thank you. Jason? Yeah, <clears throat> so I, I mean, I, um, I appreciate the thought. I, I will I'll say a couple of things. There's some information on uh, what Menhaden are um, filtering by way of particle size and, and things like that. I don't know if it gets down into species specific stuff, but folks like Kevin Friedland and, and other uh, researchers have looked at this. So it's certainly something we can look at. I think in a very, and not a, as a specific way as you're uh, thinking about it, Emerson, but they're um, one of the things that we're working on with the burp group is uh, feedback. So as prey populations decline, there's a often uh, believed to be a feedback that will then, you know, have the predator population decline. Um, and I think we mainly think about it by way of constraining growth in, in, uh, in that, but I, there may be something we can think about there. But all of that being said, it's very interesting. It's really not an element of what we currently have um, on our plate that we're analyzing for this current push. Um, so I, I'll just offer, there's potentially something there. We're not working on that uh, specifically right now. And, uh, you know, if that were something that people wanted to look at, I, I would suggest you might want to let us get through this this first slug of work before we add in new elements, but it's... Uh, it's up to the board. Ed Emerson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and uh, thank you, Jay. Yeah, I, I realize that it's not something that the technical committee is currently working on. It's just something that I've, I've been thinking about in terms of the grazing potential, if you will, of menhaden on ichthyoplankton and, and how that may affect other species. And it's part of an ecological approach. How we get at, how we get at that and, and how we utilize that I'm, I'm not sure. So I guess the first step might be for the technical committee to provide some guidance back to the board on how we can do that. Does the board wish to task the TC with following uh, up on Emerson's suggestion? Uh, I'd like to get a, some comments on that. Uh, Bill? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, this issue was brought up several years ago uh, and was looked at and was uh, if, I'm, if I'm not mistaken, considered to be not a significant problem. Um, but if it is going to be looked at, uh, I guess I would suggest that we look back at that, the record of that deliberation and whatever analyses did take place at the time. I probably have some of that in my file, so I could take a look too. Um, but um, it, it was not considered to be a big issue when all that work was done. I did have another comment uh, on Mr. Himchak's paper when it's appropriate. Thank you. That, that just, I, I'm going to come right back to you on that. I, so my sense, Emerson, maybe is that we'll um, pull out whatever bill might have, it, whatever bill was just referencing will be pulled out, 
provided to the uh, board, and then we'll circle back to this issue after we've had a chance to digest what's already been done, and then we'll sort of see where, how that looks and whether we feel like it's something that we want to pursue. Does that make sense as a short-term response? Okay, I see it. Nod, yes. So, Bill, if you don't mind, if you could provide uh, uh, Megan with, with what you have or what you know of, um, we'll do our best to circulate that to the board, and we'll revisit this at a subsequent uh, uh, meeting. And if anyone has any objection to that approach, let me know. If not, uh, I'd like to proceed in that way. Uh, Bill, you had another comment? Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I just wanted to comment that um, uh, I think there is value in looking at Menhaden abundance, as Mr. Himchek's analysis did, uh, and note that that is something that the conservation community has uh, uh, advocated for for many years because. Um, it's uh, the general view that numbers of prey is really the most important variable for predators. Um, so um, one, one option would be to evaluate the degree to which uh, reference points could be constructed around abundance, but um, we've never seen an avenue toward that, so maybe, maybe it's not really feasible. But I did want to note, though, um, that if we look at the, the results of the, the last assessment, um, the, uh, the, terminal, um, the terminal value for abundance is near the all-time low. Uh, so our, our current state, as it were, uh, is not good in terms of numbers of Menhaden, uh, and uh, the ecosystem does feel that effect. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Rob? Yeah, I just wanted to, if I may, Mr. Chairman, um, ask Jay a question. And, and one of the slides, Jay, indicated that um, the biological and ecological um, group will be working towards a better um, understanding of natural mortality. And with the work that was done by Mr. Himchak, um, is it your take from the technical committee process that uh, there's a stimulus provided by that um, paper that Mr. Himchak did? Um. So, how to answer this? I, I guess what I'll offer, Rob, is what Mr. Hemchek did was use the natural mortality that was already in the assessment. That's what he applied to it. So, um, I, I don't uh, mean to den denigrate what he did by any means. I'm just saying it's sort of, um, he took that from the assessment. He, he said that himself. So, there's he didn't offer anything new with regard to natural mortality, I guess. Maybe I could say it that way. Additional comments? Seeing none, I think we'll move on. And I uh, neglect, there is one more comment? Oh, the, David, sorry. I didn't see your hand. No worries. Uh, quick question for you. I remember in one of your earlier uh, portion of the earlier presentation, <clears throat> you had mentioned uh, the potential for an allocation shift if we were to deal with that in the future, that selectivity that leads to a, a stable uh, recruitment event might be changed. I, and I don't know if you've put anything out on that already, and I apologize if I haven't caught it yet, but maybe that might be something for uh, folks to take into consideration when considering an allocation change as well. That might be a little off the beaten path, but I figured I'd better ask. Okay, thanks, duly noted. Um, I just, before we move on to the next item, I failed to sort of do my little quick wrap up on the PID. So. Pardon me for jumping back uh, one item, but I'm now jumping back to the PID item, and I just want to make sure the board's clear on where we go from here. Megan will aim to finalize the document by next week. I will seek the assistance of our vice chair, Russ Allen, in reviewing the final document to ensure that it accurate, accurately reflects all of the changes agreed to by the board today. Megan will then need to quickly coordinate with state directors on hearings. So. If you wish to hold a hearing on the PID in your state, please let Megan know ASAP, ideally by the end of this week, if not sooner. Uh, within the next week or so, a public notice will be issued with a link to the final document and listing the dates, times, and locations of all the public hearings. So this is going to roll pretty quick, and uh, Megan does need to know um, as soon as possible. I don't think we need, she wasn't suggesting we do a uh, show of hands now. She just was asking that you please contact her within the next day or two, if possible, to let her know whether you'd like to have a public hearing on the PID in your state. Uh, and then again, I wanted to let you know that, uh, that Russ has agreed to assist me in reviewing the final document to make sure that it's good and we're going to roll with this thing. I think the goal is to have all the public hearings uh, 
completed by the end of the calendar year. Is that accurate? Yeah, I'm hoping by before Christmas. Um, that'll give us enough time to enjoy Christmas. Um, and then also um, for the public comment period to wrap up and be able to summarize the public hearings or the written comments we receive. Thank you. And again, my apologies for forgetting to uh, wrap that into the end of our uh, item. So back to the order of the agenda. We are now on to item eight, which is a progress report on the status of the Burp Working Group's efforts to develop ERPs for Atlantic Menhaden. Shanna. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I see we're all uh, saving the best for last here. Um, so to start off with, um, I just wanted to put a slide up, kind of reminding everyone of the Burp Work Group's timeline over these next few years. And this coincides with the timeline that Megan had given you earlier. Um, so as a reminder, uh, last year we had reported out on the outcome of the Ecosystem Management Objectives Workshop, um, which established management objectives moving forward um, for Menhaden. Um, and after that point, the BURP had a meeting where we kind of identified the intersection of those goals and objectives um, and the actual modeling approaches that we were considering. So from there, we kind of honed down those modeling approaches, selected a few, um, and we presented those to the board. Um, the board did recommend that the BURP move forward with those modeling approaches. Um, and so we actually met this past March to put together a general timeline that I presented to you during spring meeting week. Um, so the first thing that I have up there is kind of a big red reminder um, that this is the first time that we're really attempting to do this level of multi-species modeling uh, to generate ERPs. Uh, the timeline that we have up there is a very ambitious one. We're essentially doing multiple models with multiple species in the same time frame that you typically do a single species assessment. Um, so I just really want to take the time to kind of, you know, point out that the group that I'm working with um, an amazing group of people. They're working really hard. We understand um, how imperative it is for the board to have these answers, and we're trying to go as quickly as we possibly can. Um, and if you want to make people go faster, I suggest maybe we give everybody raises, but that's, you know, beside this point. Um, so, but I am very cautiously confident in our ability to get this done by 2019 um, and have it wrapped up and go to peer review with a BAM model. Um, so to start off with, what we decided to do is that we're going to hold um, modeling workshops. So essentially, this is a way to give the committee some time to get to know these new modeling approaches. Um, they're very novel. Um, we have some that are being externally developed. So it gives us some time to sit down, understand the back end of these models, and kind of tear them apart um, and provide some suggestions. Um, so we started that off this year. Um, in 2016 uh, with the Steele Henderson workshop, um, which was completed back in July, and I'll talk about that in just a second. Um, I have two more scheduled for next year. Um, one is our multi-species statistical catch at age model. Um, that one is being developed by none other than Jason McNamee. Um, and we have another production model in development externally that we'll also be reviewing in 2017. That's that TVR workshop that you see up there. Um, in 2018, we anticipate probably having about two data workshops. Again, I know this is a little bit different than what you're used to seeing, reason being that we'll need probably two data workshops because we're compiling data for so many different species, not just one. Um, so that's going to take some time and some vetting. Um, and then in 2019, we anticipate being able to get through our assessment workshops and eventually put that all through to the peer review with the BAM model at the end of 2019. So um, a brief update on what happened at our July modeling workshop. As I mentioned earlier, we were focusing in on our Steele Henderson production model. Um, we had a subcommittee that was essentially trying to convert this modeling approach um, to a format that was a little bit more easily accessible to the rest of our committee so they could take the time to really sit down and look at the model and understand it. Um, we vetted that model very thoroughly. Uh, I have to say it took took some time. I know Bobby sat in and listened in on that one. Um, and we tested the stability of the model um, and made some suggestions for the model setup. Um, at the end of that meeting, the group decided that we wanted to try and shift that model into another framework. Um, and some of our other leads are working on doing that right now. 
Uh, we heard a couple of updates from some of our external models that are being developed as well as had um, an update from some of our other modeling leads. Um, and from there, we had a call in October, and we ran through modeling simulations with that external model, uh, production model, that uh, Dr. Jenny Neslidge is working on. So our near future plans, we will be having a call, um, I think I set that one for December now, that I wrote this before I set that call. We have a call in December to discuss further progress on that Steele Henderson model. Um, and from there, moving into next year, we hope to hold an, our next modeling workshop to review uh, Jason's model, um, obviously once he's all wrapped up with his dissertation, so no pressure, Jay. <laughs> Um, and as we previously outlined before, we're going to try to make sure that we keep you guys um, completely informed of the situation um, each May meeting week and each um, meeting week that we have during annual meeting, just letting you know where we're at um, and keeping you in the loop on everything that we've been working on. So with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Shanna, very much. Questions for Shanna? I think it's hopefully abundantly clear that we have a process going on that does not sync with the Amendment 3 process. So we just have to be make, ensure that we're going forward eyes wide open and I think these regular updates help remind the board as to where this process is and what the timeline is associated with it. Um, so I, I appreciate the update. Any questions for Shanna? Seeing none, we're on to our last agenda item. Thank you. Um, and maybe, if, maybe if one of you guys wants to allow Tina Berger to come up, uh, I'd like to uh, have her join us up front uh, for this last item, AP membership. Um, there are two issues to be addressed by the board. Um, one is uh, nominations to fill current vacancies on the AP. I believe there are eight nominees being recommended uh, to, to fill vacancies, existing vacancies. Uh, and then there's a request from Virginia to add a third seat, that being a non-traditional stakeholder with experience in all sectors of the fishing industry, rec for hire and commercial. That request requires the board to evaluate the current configuration of the advisory panel and, deci and decide how it wants to proceed. We may need two motions on these two separate but related issues. But I just first want to take a quick step back and review where we are with regard to the configuration of the Menhaden AP. I actually did a little work here on, on uh, looking at how it's currently configured. And if the eight nominees pending before the board are all approved, the AP will have a total of 24 members. 11 commercial, 10 recreational, two what I would call sort of hybrids, they are both commercial and rec, sort of a combo there, and one conservation. One state will have three members, seven states will have two members, seven states will have one member, and one state will have no membership on the panel. That's the current configuration. My read is that that represents a pretty good balance on the AP with regard to rec and commercial representation, but there's some obvious differences in the number of panelists from each state. So uh, what is the pleasure of the board? Is the board comfortable with the current configuration? Is the board comfortable with the eight nominees? How does the board want to handle the request from Virginia to add a seat? Um, I'm intending those to be thoughtful questions because I think we need to kind of come to terms with uh, with sort of the two pieces there. One is the, are the current nominees that uh, have been put forward, and by the way, I failed to uh, note the, I think, excellent job that Tina did with her memo that essentially addresses these same issues and, and offers the board some, some ways forward. So now is the time to offer thoughts on a way forward. Robert. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and I don't have the benefit of having done work, and I appreciate your, your laying that out for us. Um, my reaction is 24 members on the advisory panel is a very, very large advisory panel. Um, to say nothing of who is on the panel or who is potentially going to be appointed, I, I, I just, it makes me go, hmm, we have that many folks. And I'm grateful again for as much interest, but I wonder, um, is that a good number? It, it, it seems high to me. Of course, this being a coast-wide uh, resource that we're managing, it seems no surprise that this might be one of the larger uh, APs, but I, I take your point. Other thoughts on the issue? And I'm happy to take this uh, in the form of two separate motions, one being a motion on the eight nominees that are before the board for consideration, and then uh, a second motion or discussion on the Virginia request. So why don't we uh, 
the, uh, actually, let me go to Dr. Duval, if, and then I'll come back to you, Bill. Uh, Dr. Duval. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So I am prepared to make a motion to, um, with regards to the eight nominees. I did just want to, before I do that, quickly say that, you know, North Carolina, we are one of the states that has two seats, but with, if these nominees are approved, we will have only one appointee to the advisory panel. Um, our open seat would be a commercial seat, and given the interest, I would still want the opportunity to be able to fill that. So with that, my motion is move to approve Bob Hanna, Patrick Paquette, Dave Monty, Megan Lapp, Paul Eidman, Leonard Voss, Peter Himchuk, and Scott Williams to the Atlantic Menhaden Advisory Panel. Is there a second to that motion? Seconded by Bill Adler. Moved by Dr. Duvall and seconded by Bill Adler to add uh, the eight nominees uh, whose names are up on the board right now. Discussion on that motion? N uh, Nicola? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, if this motion is approved, then it, it looks like Virginia will have two commercial representatives. And I was just looking for some um, staff input on what the recommended split is, if there's uh, guidelines for that. Thank you. Tina? Um, yes. Uh, I will note that of their representatives, um, Jimmy Kellum represents both, um, even though it's not specified here, the Persane industry as um, so it's reduction, and he also is bait um, industry. So he represents sort of two sectors in the one. Um, Peter Himchek obviously would represent the reduction fishery. Um, and then uh, Jeff Deem is a recreational. So there is, there is a difference in representation based on those three. Um, and it's up to the board's pleasure how they want to proceed on that. Are you okay? Yeah, yes, thank you. And just to follow up, it, from the paperwork, it looks like Jeff Deem is being appointed as a non traditional stakeholder, but it sounds more like Virginia is looking at a third seat that would have a, that would be a more of a recreational for hire seat, which I'm more comfortable with given uh, Mr. Deem's background, doesn't seem to fit the non traditional um, role, in my opinion. Yes, as, as staff explored and really looked at, um, where Jeff Dean would best fit. It was our initial thought that it would go under non-traditional, but as we thought about it, he really, other recreational um, fishermen are represented on the panel, and he fits into that pretty well. So that's why our recommendation at a, a later point was that Virginia include him as a, a third representative. Cherie, did you have a comment? Yeah, my comment was going to refer to Jeff being a recreational person and not a non-traditional, and I think we should just call a spade a spade and make sure that they're placed in the appropriate category. And I just want to remind the board that that issue is going to follow. We, the motion currently up on the board does not address that Virginia issue. That's going to follow with a subsequent motion. Uh, Bill Adler? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Speaking of Jeff Dean, he's not on that thing. Is that deliberate? He's not yes. on that motion. No, we're going to vote in, on two issues. The first oh. is uh, eight nominees to fill eight existing vacancies, okay. and then a second motion to create a new, uh, a, 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 an additional uh, position on Mer uh, Virginia for Jeff Dean. So on the motion that's up on the board, John. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Sorry to delay this further. I just wanted a clarification. I noticed that most of these applications only have one signature from commissioners on it and the form requests all three commissioners to sign on that is that just a that's not something you're requiring you just want to get that tina you know procedurally it's difficult to get all three commissioners to s literally sign the document what we ask is that the submitting uh person uh, with their signature they are um consent they have spoken to the other com commissioners and have the consent of them in the signing of that document. I'm sorry, to that point, I'll note that the two uh, nominees from Rhode Island were both uh, agreed to by all members of the Rhode Island delegation. I don't think we signed the sheet, so our bad, but but it's to Tina's point that that's the expectation. It was fulfilled in spirit, not in letter in our case. Thank you. Other comments on the motion, Adam? I'll offer the same comment with regard to New Jersey's nominee. The same happened there. 
Thank you. So all, it sounds like all the nominees have been uh, advanced with the full support of the state delegations um, that, that uh, have nominated them. Any further discussion on this motion? Is the board ready for the question? If so, is, well, is there any objection to the motion? Seeing none, the motion is approved by consent and we now need a second motion on, I see Rob, hand, Rob O'Reilly's hand up. Rob? Yeah, I think Jeff Dean being a four hire guy, he'd be very surprised about that. So let me tell you a little bit about Jeff Dean. Jeff Dean has served two different three-year terms on the Mid-Atlantic Council. He's also been the chairman of our FinFish Advisory Committee um, at VMRC for about six years. He was an instrumental force with the wind energy development that didn't happen, but uh, a lot of work was done there. He's involved in a lot of environmental issues. So what happened, there was a bit of confusion on my part when I received the roster from Tina, and I saw all these different names, and I even thought, well, Ken Hinman um, is a Virginian, so you know he's one of our members, so obviously, in terms of what we had in the past, we've always had one from the reduction fishery and one from the bait fishery, although Mr. James Kellum uh, does do a little bit of both, but primarily um, has the bait interest. And I thought with us moving forward with Amendment 3, I really would like to see Jeff Deem involved um, because we're, we're going to be going to areas that we haven't been before in terms of the biological and ecological reference points, and Mr. Deem is... Uh, very savvy about a lot of those issues. So that's where the third nominee came from. At first, I didn't know it was going to be a third nominee, but working with Tina, I finally straightened that out. So uh, that's a little bit about Mr. Deem, and I would certainly move to add him as a uh, third member for Virginia. Rob, do you want to, I guess, do we need to clarify the, the nature of that position, Tina? I think your discuss discussion is clear. Thank you. So uh, a motion has been made to appoint Jeff Dean from Virginia as a third member from Virginia to the Atlantic Menhaden Advisory Panel. Is there a second to that motion? Seconded by uh, Nicola Reserve. Uh, Reserve. Any discussion on the motion? This would be creating a third AP position for Virginia and filling it. It's doing two things, creating the third position and filling it with Jeff Dean. That's the two uh, upshots of this motion, if I understand it correctly. Discussion on the motion? Uh, Dave? Yep, thanks. He certainly sounds like a, a, a good individual to add. I'm, I'm just wondering in terms of policy and for other boards, I, I, th I thought our policy or rule was that there were a maximum of two per state, and but there, Tina's saying no. so. If this, if this doesn't change, if this doesn't create a precedent for other boards, then, then I'm fine with it. Actually, when the AP was created, there were a different number of seats per state based on the needs of those states. So it's not always a standard two per state. Any further discussion on this motion? Is there any objection to the motion? Seeing none, the motion is approved by consent. And I believe we have reached the end of our meeting. Is there any other business to be brought before the board? Seeing none, is there any objection to adjourning? Seeing none, we are adjourned. Thank you very much.